Well, we do have a quorum. We are missing two individuals. One individual we know is going to be late. The other, I don't know. But we have a quorum, and I'd like to get started on time. So we're calling to order our briefing session and the time stamp. Whoop. Atomic Apple clock says 559. We got one minute. For some seconds there. For some seconds there. Oh, just changed to 6 o'clock. Okay. <laughs> I know, Adina, I'm a, number, I'm a numbers guy. Yeah, I'm just going to have to get started. All right, how are you? It is 6 o'clock. It is October the 18th, and we are opening our, our briefing session uh, with presentations. And uh, the first thing that we're going to be doing, let's see. We're, if, if, if council's consent, uh, if you look, one of the items that we have is on the streetlight policy as a briefing item. And Mr. Govan. Our regional representative for Encore is here. However, he has to be somewhere else. He has to leave at 620, if I understand, right? Yes, sir, please. So with council's uh, consent, if we can kind of change it so that Mr. Uh, Govan can talk about this. But unfortunately, the guy that put this on the agenda isn't here yet. Can we move it to 619? Well, <laughs> 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 uh, Mr. Coates put it on the agenda. You can watch the recording. Mr. Goldman has to go. Well, I'd be okay with it. There he is. There he is. There he is. Okay, you're right. We, we have already opened the meeting, Mr. Coates, and Mr. Uh, Goldman is going to start because he needs to leave at 6.20. Since you put the item on the agenda, just I wanted to wait until you got here. So, Mr. Goldman, the floor is yours, sir. Oh, you're not presenting. Just ask anybody if you have questions for him. Okay. Um, so, we're going to open this now. Go ahead, Ms. Cole. Brianna's going to assist, I guess. Yeah, actually, Brianna will be giving the presentation tonight. So, good evening, Mayor and City Council. I'm Jackie Colton, the Interim Director of Public Works. And I am pleased to introduce to you all tonight Ms. Brianna Davis. She is an executive assistant in the Public Works Department. She's been with the city almost three and a half years. She is an excellent employee. She actually is a graduate of Baylor University with a Bachelor of Arts degree. So, because she is our primary point of contact as it relates to streetlights, with outages, uh, contact with the citizens, and Encore, she will be presenting tonight. So with that, I'd like to invite Ms. Davis to present. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, good evening, Mayor and Council. Good evening. Um, I'll be presenting today on the Public Works Department's internal streetlight policy. So this discussion was requested by Councilmember Coates after receiving an inquiry from a resident on whether additional mid-block streetlights could be added to the streets outlined on the screen. So our goal, of our, the goal of our current policy essentially is to benefit uh, traffic safety and not necessarily provide security lighting. So with that goal in mind, we have standards for installing streets on, installing street lights on undivided streets, which are those primarily, primarily in your residential neighborhoods and then installing streets on the divided, installing street lights on the divided thoroughfares, which are your main streets like Camp Wisdom, Cedar Ridge, and Denningville. So as far as the spacing standards are concerned, for those undivided streets, which are those in the residential neighborhoods, our current policy states that we should install street lights at intersections at mid-block locations. Typical spacing for that is about 500 to 1,000 feet. And any additional roadside features that the public works director may deem necessary, and some of those may be if there is significant curvature in the road, and if there's an area that's adjacent to a drainage structure. So for those divided thoroughfares, like in Camp Wiesel and Cedar Ridge, our typical spacing is about <coughs> 150 to 300 feet for street lights. They those lights may uh, be. Yeah. Your numbers are reversed. Go, go back. Go back. On this one, it says. The light, I mean, I'm sorry about that. The photos, yeah, they were switched. Sorry about that. So this one should be the other photo. My apologies. So which one is it? So <laughs> the slides are incorrect. The slides are correct. Your verbiage is wrong. Which 
you know, the, the, the piece, display, this so. photo, the display, yeah. The display. So this photo should be on the previous slide for okay. the undivided streets, and then this photo should be on the next slide. So undivided streets is 500,000, as you spoke it. Yes. And divided is 150 to 300. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. My apologies for that. Thank you. Okay, and those lights on the divided thoroughfares, they may be installed in a staggered installation pattern. And then there are double lights that can be installed at intersections and bridge structures. Um, so one thing to mention here, um, the lights are typically spaced a little bit closer together because there's a lot of traffic on those main thoroughfares. And so because our goal is to um, provide adequate lighting for traffic safety, we try to make sure that there are a lot of lights on those main thoroughfares. So a little bit of background on our inventory. <coughs> 2,400 street lights in the city. So we pay about $400,000 to JEXA every year for in electrical costs. And that comes to about $170 per street light per year for electrical costs. As far as the new install costs, um, that's determined by Encore. So after we've received um, the design for what they would want to do as installing a new street light, we would have to then contract with them to install that light. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. And then there are division of responsibilities. So with the street lights that we have, they're all owned and maintained by Encore, but they also provide an outage reporting system for us to be able to report whether there are street light outages. But we also provide that information to the residents so that they can report them themselves. And for the city of Duncanville, we initiate the process to install those street lights, and then of course we pay for them. So the process uh, after we've re received our internal request, it'll be then approved and then we'll take it to Encore. Encore would then prepare a design for the install of the new street lights. We'd have to approve that design and then they would provide us with a supplemental agreement and then we'll agree to that. The city will be billed for the installation, they will install the lights and then they will provide that information to JEXA so that we can get that new light on our energy bill. So one thing about the installation, it the timeline is determined by multiple factors but one of them includes whether there's already an existing pole for a light to be placed on so generally i was able to speak to one of the um, engineers involved in this process he said if there's a pole already existing from installation or the request for installation to actual install can take maybe six weeks or more but if there's not already a pole installed and one would have to be installed, that process can take maybe 12 weeks or so. But it all depends on construction and material availability. So there's a few factors that affect installation. One obviously being, like, being the budget. So after we've received Encore's cost estimate, we would have to then, then determine whether we have the funds available to accommodate that request. Power availability is another. So, um, Light or power may not be available in a city right away in some other residential neighborhoods. And so we would then have to see if it's available in the rear or side yard easements. And one thing that plays into that is if it is available in rear or side yard easements, we, may, we would have to get the consent of the property owner to install a, uh, sorry, install a street light in that location. So that's another one for the consent of the property owner. And then our current policy does state that we will not install street lights in alleys and then those rear and side yard easements. So one reason for that is because generally in alleys, there is a lot less traffic than on those main thoroughfares and even just regular residential streets. And also to the, um, I'm sorry, also to the speed limit is a lot lower than in the regular streets. So that's one reason why we do not install street lights in those areas. So for those who are interested in security lighting options, they do have some options available, primarily being guard lights. So they would actually reach out to a contractor who installs these structures, and then they would reach out to Encore to service that light if they were to choose to do this. So primarily these options do face the property, as the private property, as you can see here, but if a resident were to choose to ask for that light to face the street light behind them, they could choose to do so if they wanted to. In addition to guard lights, there are also floodlights and other smart uh, lighting options that are available to residents if their primary concern is security. So with that in mind, 
um, that's our current policy. And so we wanted to present it to you to see if you desire any revisions to that. And if so, what will be your recommendations? So, Mr. Coons? Yes, sir. Review, uh, sir. So, a couple of questions. And, and so, first of all, thank you for the presentation. And also, thank you for the information that you've been sending uh, in response to the citizen request for information. Um, so, first of all, so you referred to this as an internal policy for public works. So, this isn't the city policy. It's an internal public works only policy that um, the department developed. It's not been codified anywhere or anything like that. Yes, sir. Would that would it be recommended that we look into adopting this as a, a city policy? I would ask the city attorney that any policy that's adopted internally by any executive director or any department of the city is by reference. I think it pretty much policy. is a city it policy. It doesn't have to be codified in an ordinance. It just becomes part of a city policy. If you try to, to, codify, if you try to codify it into an ordinance, you might kind of hamstring yourself because then it would okay. get too specific. The most we would probably suggest is saying that you have the authority or that you will set a policy and then setting the policy like this in case there are changes that need to be made. You can make them quicker and not have that policy hamstring you or tying you to putting it every 500 feet if that becomes too much or too little in the future. So that we can ascertain then from that, Mr. Coons, that a policy of public works is city policy. Exactly. It's codified into work. Okay. And just, and the reason why I ask is just in doing research, I know uh, other cities do have it codified, so uh, but you're saying it's not recommended to do that. That was Hager's advice, and I think and I agree as well. You could put it in there, but then that is the law of the city, so you're going to have to operate by it. And if you want to change it, you're going to have to repeal and pass a new ordinance, whereas if you have this, you can say, New policy is this. Uh, what what kind of lights do we use? We're going to defer to Mr. Go that would be right now the city. Can you stand up, Mr. Go ahead, please? 90% um, of the city, 90% of the lights in Duncan right now, what they call high pressure silicons. Those are the yellow lights that really have been, that have been here forever. What we're doing is uh, about Four years ago, the city of Duncanville, along with other cities in our service territories, signed an agreement that as those lights go out, we actually change them out to LED lights. Those are the bright white lights that are, that are coming out, that are out. And what, what's our, our cost savings in switching over to the, the LEDs? Uh, we're not looking at cost savings. We're looking at a lot of times, and, and there, there's a savings there, but the main reason for Encore doing it is because they're brighter and they're cleaner. But let me say this, if I can, extremely good presentation. A very nice presentation. I've, I've, I've heard different people give them on behalf of Encore, and that was one of the best ones I've heard. I can't have her, because she. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking my utility design. But anyway, yes. Let's continue, Mr. Coach, please. So, and then um, looking at our policy and comparing it to some other cities, uh, ours is kind of a, a bare bones uh, policy. Would, would we be able to come back with some just maybe best practices as far as recommendations? Let's see if, if those could be ascertained. I think there's a key to what's in this policy, and what Brianna explained as well, is that our policy is not for security. I never said it. Right, so our, our policy is concerns in terms of traffic you know, on our streets. Right. And so that's why I know some individuals are looking for what can you do for my neighborhood. Well, I think uh, the concern is that, and I think the policy is meant to focus more on uh, drivers, right, and motorists. Right. Uh, and so if, if you're driving around certain parts of the city, uh, and there are some streets that uh, there's, there's a light mid-block, you know, clearly it's not. 200 foot spacing. Um, as a matter of fact, in the same in the neighborhood that's being uh, asked about, you know, two streets over, they, they do have lights mid block that are fewer than 200 feet apart or 500 feet apart. Um, and again, different parts of the city, it seems like you know, the policy has been, uh, I don't know, circumvented or maybe I don't know if the lights were there before the policy was in place or before revisions. But and unfortunately, I wouldn't know the answer to that. <laughs> Because Encore's Encore responsibility is if the city calls and said they want a light at this location, 
we would look at exactly what it takes to get it there. If there's facilities available there, uh, we would turn that request in and the cost into the city. The city pays that, and we will put it there. We don't. We don't have. We can't tell the city we have parking lots. And I just think that the concern that the residents have brought up is that when they're driving on to the streets, Oleander, Candlelight, that they're dark when they're driving through there. And again, there are other places in town that the streets are shorter, and there is a light mid block. And so I'm just trying to understand. Um, again, if we're possibly looking at revising the policy. To allow so for example some cities go through a petition process just like we do with uh, road homes right. mm -hmm. um, if, if we could introduce maybe something like that if citizens were concerned um, but again it's the, the concern is driving through those streets and i drove through them they're pretty dark going through there, and you got cars parked on both sides of the road um, and you know some of the streets that i drove on they do have lights mid-block where you don't have the 500 foot spacing you know, I, I didn't see any of the roadside features that, that, that might be a reason why those lights are there. Um, and so, you know, if there's any way that, again, we could ask staff to just look at best practices on this, if there's anything they can bring back to us that might help. Um, Councilman, can I ask a question? Yes, sir. Is, is some of the areas that you're asking about, are they dark because the lights don't work or no, the lights are not there? There's no lights. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sure we do have situations where sometimes when they don't work, Right. But we actually need customers or people to actually respond and let us know that they don't work. Mm -hmm. That was the streetlight reporting right. outage that she talked about in regards to that. Right. A lot of times people know, we think we know that they don't work. Thank you, Mr. Govan. Mr. Contreras. Yeah, just briefly, uh, I can tell you that we have had a history in the past, and I'm not sure how much this policy has changed over the years, but where uh, directors of public works have considered when requested, they've gone out and looked at locations. And in some neighborhoods, like Whispering Hills, I think they added two or three street lights because they realized it didn't meet today's standards of separation. So there, there have been, it's not just that one. Um, throughout the time I worked for the city, uh, they always gave consideration to going out and looking and then, and then placing a new street light if they deemed it was necessary. And I can attest personally that there, and uh, it came to me as, as mayor, a citizen, I'm not going to mention the street or the area, but. It was, there was no light whatsoever, and we went to Encore, and uh, we budgeted for it, and Encore installed one light. And it was because of traffic. It was because of darkness as well. And that was about, what, two years ago? Two or three years ago, I think we did that. Mayor, in talking to staff and, and just listening to your concerns, I think what we need to do is it's probably time for us to get together with the development service and public work and just look at our administrative policy, which is what I call our policies, and look at what additions. The other part is putting in a policy or a process like the street lights to say, for example, if a neighborhood wants an additional light, the type of petition, because you may have one neighbor who's like, I want more lights, and the other's like, you're killing our environment. <coughs> so that, you know, we, we've been dealing with that, and I think even here, we've had some complaints in the past where people said, that the lights were messing with them mentally. I received complaints about the lights are too bright. It, mm -hmm. It's an ecological issue. It makes the owls, uh, disturbs the owls. But we come up with a process. And all this kind of, so and I think that's it, goes, it goes both ways. Yeah. I think those are things that can happen. Yeah. But certainly we can look at best practices. Yeah, Mr. Magnum. Just a real quick question for Mr. Govan. Yes, sir. What's the approximate? I know you don't have an exact figure, but what's the approximation of cost of putting the light in? That's a very hard number. Um, again, as the presentation said, depending on what's available there, if we have to run a we have to run a line. If there's already a pole there that doesn't have facilities on it, but we have poles that just has a wire on it, we can usually hang a light on that pole, and there's no cost to the city for us doing that. But if there's no pole there and no facilities there, uh, that can cost anywhere from you know a thousand to five thousand dollars, just depending on how far they have to go. Okay. But we can look at best practices, Mr. Coates, for sure. Thank you. Now, I just have one other question. So the, this policy was revised in 2008. Do we know what revisions were made at that time? So in 14 years, it's probably worthwhile to take another look. <laughs> okay. Can we set a date to bring it back to you? Um, we're in October. Uh, can we bring it back the first meeting in December so we could do it? Just give staff just, enough time to take a look at it. And okay? Mr. Kutz, if you have other cities' uh, information that you could send to the city manager, 
that would save staff a lot of time doing some research. If you've done that, that would be helpful. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Gomez, thank you, sir. Thank you. Rainfall uh, events in August resulted in significant river flows in Dental Creek, damaging an existing six inch sanitary sewer aerial crossing near 383 Softwood Drive. City crews were quickly to provide a temporary repair, restoring uh, wastewater flow across the bridge into the Trinity River Authority Main. The resolution will approve the Dunway Professional Services contract for the design to permanently repair the aerial crossing and river bank reinforcement at the crossing. Item 4C. Okay, um, I'm going to uh, halt city manager's covering of consent items because it is my request that this item 4C be taken from a consent item to an item of individual consideration, which any member, according to our rules of procedure, any member of the city council has the authority to do so. And I'm asking this be taken from consent, I'm basically directing at this point. Uh, this, this item come from consent to individual consideration, and I will give you the reasons why. You have the papers, some two documents that I recently printed off. Uh, you have these documents. I know you haven't had a chance to read them, but basically it's talking about uh, in August of 22, Wells Fargo woes continue, a rotten culture that continues to stink, and another article from Forbes uh, in terms of September 26th of 2022, Wells Fargo is in trouble again. If you keep up with what's going on in the financial realm, Wells Fargo, several years ago, 
was found to be conducting fraudulent business practices in the banking world. They were fined significant hundreds of millions of dollars for their purposes. And going back to 2018, when I first became a council member, this subject of where we're going to do our banking came up, and I opposed going back to Wells Fargo again. And the reason I opposed it was because of Wells Fargo's fraudulent business practices. Not necessarily that the local business is doing that, but the corporate business is doing it. And they were fined by the SEC and the financial banking industry itself. And I felt that what we needed to do as a city, because of our council's fiduciary responsibility to itself and to our citizens, that we should be doing our financial business with the financial institution other than Wells Fargo. The finance director at that particular time said that, you know, it costs too much to change over. And I said, in what way? Well, we got to have checks this, we got to do this, we got to have documents that, and so on and so forth. And so rather than an item of ethical responsibility, it became an item of financial responsibility, and I was still opposed to going with Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo has kind of gone under the radar, and then recently they're back in the news. They're back in the news for fraudulent business practices, for unethical business practices, and I feel that we as a city should consider another financial institution. Now, if you look at all the documentation, uh, there were nine banks that were, that were queried if they wanted to participate in this particular uh, request for procurement. Uh, only three responded, uh, Chase, Wells Fargo, and what was it? Frost. Uh, and Frost. What I am not suggesting is that we redo this thing, or if that's what is necessary, if you feel. I think when we get into the council chamber itself, I will reiterate what I just spoke here, and I will not approve, I will not vote to approve going back with Wells Fargo. Whatever you as a council decide to do, that is a council decision. I'm letting you know that I will present this information in council, and I will say that I will not approve going back to Wells Fargo. Now, what in terms of our procurement falling under our financial uh, finance director's purview, what they may decide to do, or what we as a council may decide to do as we get out there in a non-individual consideration, do we redo the entire process, or is it up to maybe uh, Teo and, and Ms. Atmore to decide, do we go toward the second and third offer in terms of the process? Noting that the contract expires in February of 2023. So there is time to relook this thing. What I'm not going to suggest here, but I want to open for discussion out there, is what do you folks think as council that what we ought to do? All I can tell you now is that information past and present indicates that Wells Fargo is not a financial institution that I feel the city needs to be in, in, uh, in relationship with because of the monies and, and transactions and so on. And yes, now, I did advise a uh, city manager and finance director that I was going to do this. It's not catching them cold. Uh, and I think that you've been aware of that as well, that's why you have these documents. Um, one question, uh, Ms. Atmore, that, that I will ask out there that I haven't had time to, to ask you yet is your opinion on terms of the costs of changing from one financial institution to another. And you probably don't have that in your it's hip pocket. Oh, that's you know, if it's all there, then we understand that that will come out as well. So that is why I am asking that this take be taken from consent to individual consideration. That's my background. Yes. Just a quick question because I have no idea uh, in, in this regard. Um, we have a, a local branch here, and you, you said that this complaint wasn't reflective on all the branches across the country. So we have a, a local branch that we're currently doing business with, isn't that right? Correct. Okay. So how do we how do we take that into consideration the impact that this would have on our local branch, which if there haven't been allegations of them having committed any wrongdoing, do we want to hurt a community bank? And what impact would it have on that bank? I don't know that each individual bank was identified in terms of those fraudulent practices were being conducted. Those fraudulent practices were, were nationwide. 
Yeah, but yeah, I'd like you to wanted to get the SEC that. and if you wanted to get the banking institution finance to, to document everywhere those things were going, we could, okay, I'm going to make a statement, rightly or wrongly, that if headquarters, Wells Fargo says do this. Okay, this is your opinion, and I've got your opinion already, and I respect it. What I'm asking is just during the presentation, if we could address any impacts that we feel that we have on a local bank, because it seems like we have to take into consideration it does, whether it changes the the outcome or not, <clears throat> are we negatively impacting our local bank and its employees um, in a way that, that I'm not aware of? And I'd just like an explanation out on the floor when we get to that. That's all. Okay. Okay. Sure. Yes. Yeah. And discuss. And I would assume that there's going to be negative impact. Okay. Thank you. Certainly. Okay. okay. Uh, item 4D, consider a resolution approving an interlocal agreement between the city of Duncanville and Dallas County to provide highway accident investigation services and the amount not to exceed $59,000. For many years, the city of Duncanville's police department has contracted with the Dallas County Sheriff's Department for accident investigation of motor vehicles on Interstate 20 and U.S. Highway 67 within the city of Duncanville. Dallas County offers a program in which Dallas County deputies investigate traffic accidents occurring on the interstates and highways within Dallas County. Initially, the program was provided for a free of charge. However, several years ago, Dallas County began to charge their cities for this service. The charge is a flat rate per year rather than per accident. And for our proposed agreement, the flat rate is $59,000 and will not exceed that amount. The city of Duncanville has significantly benefited from our participation in the program. Uh, for example, in fiscal year 2022, deputies from Dallas County Sheriff Office investigated 125 vehicular accidents on Interstate 20 and U.S. Highway 67. While our patrol personnel initially respond to the accidents, aid these injured and control traffic, they are relieved from the accident once enough sheriff deputies arrive on the scene. They can resume patrol in neighborhoods and answering calls and other service um, in a timely and efficient manner. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Item 40. Consider adopting the council rules and procedures. On August 8th, council met in special session to discuss changes in the documents that govern the roles and responsibilities of council city manager, city attorney, and city secretary. Council members' relations to each other, the city manager and staff, rules of council meeting, and regulations to which council members should adhere. After receiving feedback from council, staff drafted and amended the document to incorporate the direct revisions. Those revisions were presented in a briefing session on September 20th meeting, and council provided additional direction to staff for revisions. After the final revision was added and the post of the agenda, you should have received another copy because we did get some feedback, some things we may have left out or did not specifically state. And a copy of the updated document was provided to council. That concludes. Just want to make sure everybody did see the email that was sent out with the updated document. Okay, very good. All right, that concludes that. And concludes our briefing and work session. You're doing good, folks. So uh, we can go ahead and cease this briefing session at this point. What, oh, one thing is in terms of some housekeeping. <laughs> um, you were advised uh, by text message at my request to the city secretary that I will be asking for a vote by city council to take more than three minutes for the for the mayor's report. By our rules of procedure, I can't just do that, and I can't do it by consensus. It has to be by a majority vote. So I have some things that I would like to cover tonight in my mayor's report that quite certainly versus possibly we're going to take more than three minutes. Okay? So just be aware of that when we get out there that I will be asking for your vote and, and to be able to be uh, to do that. Okay? All right. So uh, please be out there at 7 o'clock. We at 635.
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. The time is 7 o'clock, and the date is October the 18th of the year 2022. Welcome to our city council meeting. Getting things underway. Want to call on our mayor pro tem, council member Joe Vera Cruz, for the invocation. Please rise. All right, let us pray. Heavenly Father, once again, Lord, I thank you for another day that wasn't promised. Father, as always, we reach out to you for the protection of our city, our staff, and of course, our residents. Lord, as anyone and everyone that comes in and out of the city, Lord, that they may know that you rule here. Father, I also pray for our marketplace, our businesses, and entrepreneurs, Lord, that we will continue to grow. Father, in your mighty name, I ask a blessing over our first responders, Lord, or, which are near and dear to my heart, which go out and do your work, but they're the first representative of our city, of residents or citizens that are traveling through. Father, I ask all of this in your mighty name. Amen. Amen. Please join me in pledges to our flag. I pledge allegiance. Please be seated. Moving on to item number one, our agenda. Item number 1A is the mayor's report. In accordance with our rules of procedure, section three, paragraph E, I am going to request a vote by our city council members present. Oh, by the way, Mr. Harvey, uh, is somewhere on his way or will be delayed as best as we understand. I need to take more than three minutes, I believe it's going to take more than three minutes, <laughs> from a mayor's report. In order to do that, to exceed the three minutes in our rules of procedure, I need to ask permission by vote of the city council members present to exceed the three minutes. So uh, with that, I'm asking someone needs to make a motion, I guess, Mayor, to I move. do that. Yeah. I move that we second. We have a motion and a second uh, to allow me to take more than three minutes. Uh, Council, if you would please vote. Thank you, unanimously approved. The first item I would like to discuss is information item for you. There has been some information on social media and throughout our, our city in terms for the tragic death of an individual, homeless individual in our city. Uh, he has been homeless for some time. His mother was a resident of our city. 
and uh, this particular individual, it's, it, at one point I was going to try and keep his name private, but I understand it's been pretty well publicized, Michael Curry. Tragically, he was killed on Highway 67 a few days ago. Now, the fact that he is homeless, he was harmless. A lot of us saw him around our city and attempted to give him some help, uh, but he just decided that that was his, the way he wanted to live. In recognition of his life, Mr. Lewis Rainey, who was the owner of the Pelican House on Cedar Ridge, Mr. Rainey wants to do Sorry. Mr. Rainey uh, wants to do a food drive in Mr. Curry's memory. And the food that is gathered from this food drive will go to the Duncanville Outreach Ministry. Uh, Mr. Rainey is doing this on his own, but I think it's commendable. And that's why I wanted to bring it to your attention and for the city's attention to be able to participate. Now, Mr. Rainey is asking for individuals that wish to participate and bring food in memory of Mr. Uh, of Michael Curry uh, from 5 to 7 tomorrow evening at the Pelican House. And then that food will be taken over to the Duncanville Outreach, Min Outreach Ministry. And I talked to, to Lewis this afternoon. I'm sure that uh, if anybody can't make it from 5 to 7 tomorrow, that any other time that you wish to drop off some food over to the Pelican House would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. The second item I would like to address is another somber one, regrettably, and it concerns the passing of a former athletic star here in the city of Duncanville, Tiffany Jackson. I don't know if you're aware of Tiffany. Tiffany was on our women's basketball team of the Duncanville High School when, uh, and she enabled the team to take state in 2003. Because of her athleticism, she was um, recruited by the University of Texas where she was a star and she eventually went into the Women's National Basketball Association and in March of this year, in fact, she was selected to be the women's uh, basketball coach at Marshall University Unfortunately, she lost a battle with cancer October 3rd. The school district had a memorial for her yesterday, and I asked if I may participate in that, and I was granted being able to do so. I would like to read to you for the record what I read at Tiffany's memorial yesterday at the Duncanville High School. To Assistant Director as Athletic Director Coach Landers and Athletic Director Weaver and Miss Jackson. Josephine Jackson is uh, Tiffany's mother. She was there as well as two or three of her godmothers were present. Quote, thank you to all who are joining with us tonight as we remember Tiffany Jackson. On behalf of the city of Duncanville, the city of champions, I am honored to be a part of this memorial to one of our city champions, Tiffany Jackson. And her efforts, in fact, contribute to our tagline for our city, City of Champions. As a player for the women's basketball team, she led the Panthers to the state championship in 2003. Tiffany distinguished herself by her exceptional athleticism on the court and received national recognition as a McDonald's All-American and Texas Gatorade Player of the Year. Her collegiate career at the University of Texas was equally exceptional, having recorded school women's basketball records that still stand today. Tiffany's talent propelled her into the WNBA, playing for the Liberty, Tulsa Shock, and Los Angeles Sparks. In 2015, Tiffany was diagnosed with stage three breast cancer, which she eventually beat. Regrettably, the cancer returned. Tiffany fought that battle valiantly just as she fought on the court. Sadly, she lost that battle. October 3rd, only 37 years old. 
It is with deep regret or deep sadness we're here to honor and celebrate her life. A true champion and champion of the city of Duncanville, our thoughts and our prayers are with Tiffany's family and her many friends. Thank you for your indulgence and I apologize. <laughs> On a happier note, <laughs> um, we have in our city something called the Property Improvement Program, the PIP, and it was established uh, by Miss Betty Dunn in the in the first the United Methodist Church here in Duncanville, and there were uh, two weekends that the uh, PIP program was here in our city, and I believe uh, correctly they worked on nine homes. 10 homes, 10 homes. And in recognition of that, this is the first city council meeting uh, subsequent to the performance of those property improvement programs. I asked Betty and any volunteers that were able to come tonight to please come forward and to be recognized. So Betty, if you and any of your volunteers would please come up, I would appreciate it. And city council, if you would join me out there and, and shake these folks' hands and thank them for what they did. And I know as well, uh, Mr. Mac Burnett and Mr. Contreras and uh, any other, and other, any city council members and staff that worked on the on the PIP, please come out and, and be recognized as well. I also want to recognize that uh, Mr. Zul Hudani, who is the owner of the Popeyes franchise on Camp Wisdom, uh, provided the meals for these all these individuals that were working. How many total volunteers did you have, Betty? Total of 85. 85 volunteers came out and did that work. Thank you very much, because it's it's a wonderful <laughs> program. And my final item, um, I don't know how my time factor is, but I'll be able to close. My final item is coffee with the mayor uh, that I do every month is this coming Thursday at the Senior Center at noon. So thank you for that. Okay. And City Council, thank you for indulging me and allowing me to exceed my three minutes with that. Uh, so any uh, City Council members reports? Mr. McBurnett. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I am glad to see our PIP people here as well. Uh, it's it's a wonderful time working with you, and, and uh, Betty, I have another card for you that somebody else is interested in as well. Uh, I also want to acknowledge the city for two nice events. We had Operation Clean Duncanville recently, as well as a police open house. Very, very well done events. Thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, Mr. Coons. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to remind citizens that the city is still accepting applications for boards and commissions. So um, we're still accepting applications for community engagement board, which we recently uh, appointed, or accepting applications for uh, arts commission and a multicultural commission. And I also believe planning and zoning uh, commission also uh, has some open seats there. So we just want to encourage all citizens that um, if you're looking for a way to get involved with the city and make a contribution and serve uh, to look uh, to applying to some of those boards and commissions. And I believe the information is on the, the website and the application is there on the city website. So I want to encourage you to take a look at that. Um, also, uh, in collaboration with the, the Duncanville Library and the friends of the, the Duncanville Library, uh, if you have kids ages 6 to 12, we have a, a book club uh, that meets every second Thursday of the month. And so uh, if you've got, again, kids around that age, we met uh, last week at Historical Park here in Duncanville, and the theme was history. And so, again, if you've got kids, kids ages 6 to 12 and you're interested in that uh, club, uh, reach out to me and let me know. And then finally, I just wanted to thank the citizens in the city. Uh, we went to TML was that last week or two weeks ago, yeah. Um, and so uh, that, that's always a very educational experience for me, and I always benefit a great deal from that. And so I just want to thank the citizens for the support in that and allowing the council to do that. So thank you. Thank you. Mr. Contreras. Um, <clears throat> Mayor, I also want to um, uh, acknowledge the loss of a great citizen um, in Duncanville, Ron White, who uh, we went to his memorial service. The mayor was there. And, and I, I want to thank the mayor for preparing a very quick proclamation that they read or that they have to read uh, at the Concord Church. Um, Ron was a, a man that was uh, meant so much to this city, successful businessman, humble to the core, a man of faith, and his wife Sharon was the same. And um, we wish our best to Sharon and uh, the White's children. Uh, they were somebody really special to this city. We miss Ron. Thank you. Yes, thank you for that, Mr. Contreras. It's, uh, Ron was a great asset to our city as well, serving on many, many boards and in, in involvement for, for what he did, not just for the city, the city and our administration, but for the schools. Very involved with the Duncanville Independent School District in many, many of its aspects. Uh, Mr. Mac Burnett again. Yes. Sorry, sorry, Mayor. I did have one more item to remind people about. Our winter averaging is coming up in relation to sewer charges and stuff, so it's November, December, January. So that's how your sewer is determined, so please know that's coming up and watch your usage. Okay, thank you. Seeing no other council members' uh, reports, the city manager's report, please. Thank you, Mayor and Council. I uh, just want to give an update. Uh, we, uh, the Council approved a senior citizens water sewer utility discount program in our last budget. And over the past few weeks, the utility customer service office received a total of 2,290 inquiries about the discounted rate for seniors. Uh, it was pointed out we want to make sure that we are communicating to our seniors to make sure they know if you know of a senior, you, need, you just need to stop by and pick up an application. And we're going to do a little bit more advertising to make sure that we reach our seniors so that they know this is available. On September 30th, the IT uh, department uploaded the new increased font sizes for all the water utility statements and customers began to receive new and improved statements this month. We do recognize that has been a struggle. Uh, we are working on revamping and sometimes in the attempt to get a lot of information on we end up with something that's not quite easily read and so we are continuing to work on this but this is our first attempt at increasing the font size but we are also looking at a total redesign to ensure that the information that's most important to our citizens are available. 
From September 23rd to October 1st, 10 houses, properties were improved by work from volunteers, as we talked about with our PIP program. Uh, I want to thank our team uh, and Mr. Jeremy Tennant on our team who helped to get our staff together. Uh, we spent a morning working on painting and repairing. We were led by the Honorable uh, Mr. Greg Contreras uh, as a team, and I think we followed instructions very well. And so it's always an, a good opportunity to give back to the community, and we plan to continue that effort. Our Senior Center has been the center of a lot of our programs. As you have noticed, we've been implementing different programs each month, and we hope to continue to do that. Uh, they're offering free painting and twist class, but also we've hosted a number of events over the past few weeks, including the Over the Rainbow, the Golden Ears, uh, partnerships uh, with wellness. We celebrated Hispanic Heritage Month, and we've also done bagels. Uh, we've also had bingo, cake decorating, coffee with the mayor, and piano performance by our council member, Mr. Coombs. The Senior Center will be hosting several other functions and events, a bagel social, bingo, the nightmare before Christmas, uh, they went to the State Fair on October 20th, Medicare benefits and Cigna. Uh, and also I'd like to say and thank them and thank Noel and the Parks and Rec for our Hispanic Heritage uh, Coffee Fireside Chat because those events are an opportunity for us to celebrate our cultural diversity in our community and we're going to continue to offer events uh, such as that. The Friends of Library held a successful book sale on Saturday, September 24th, and earned approximately $500, uh, as we said. Also, Councilmember Coots hosted Storytime on September 29th, reading fall stories to our children. The library will host other events, uh, fun events in coming weeks, teen tumber, tumber uh, with snacks, family board games, fall youth programs, reading buddies, and fall youth program for homeschool reading rangers. As of October 1st, the library no longer charges for overdue fees. This was one of the other things that was included in our budget is we removed fees or late fees. Now, if books do not return, there is a fee for books that aren't returned, but late fees have uh, been eliminated. Today was the last day to submit entries for the Ghouls, Ghosts, and Goblin Creative Writing Competition for fifth and sixth graders. The winning story will be featured in the library's November newsletter. On Saturday, September 24th, our, we celebrated Hispanic Heritage Month with a Latino concert, and this was held uh, at our park. There were over 13 vendors and 300 people in attendance. Movies in the park in Armstrong Park on September 17th had 75, and the Catfish Catch and Fishing with the Duncanville Police event at Lakeside Park on October 1st had 25 participants. Boo Bash 2022 will be held on Friday, October 28th at 6.30 p.m. at Duncanville Fieldhouse. Uh, I'd like to say that uh, in our police department, we had 16 pr prospective police officers who took the civil service exam on Saturday, September 24th. Of these 16, 12 passed the written and physical endurance. They are now on the civil service police eligibility list. This is very important as recruitment has sometimes been a challenge. Uh, we had national night out on October 4th, over 200 people in attendance. And over the past few weeks, uh, our police department has been active in solving crimes. And I also want to congratulate our new assistant chief, Ch assistant chief freeze, who is officially now the assistant police. And I think our police chief will talk a little bit more in his report. Within our fire department, Ms. Lauren Sanchez, our emergency management operations coordinator, has been training uh, the dispatchers on the use of our new mass notification system, uh, which is part of Duncanville, Cedar Hill, and DeSoto, and joining other cities will allow us to better streamline our coverage in the event of emergencies. She's also attended other trainings uh, within our city. Our fire personnel has also been updating our annual health assessment this month for our, our on-duty health. These assessments are important tools to ensure our firefighters health is, is, is protected. We also need to announce that we will be postponing our ground breaking of our new fire station, which was scheduled for next week, and more information is to follow. And last, I'd like to mention that uh, being that this is October, it is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and we will be hosting for our employees. One of the most important things that I have are my coworkers and our city employees, and so we are going to have our Duncanville Pink Party on Tuesday, October 25th for our city employees from 11 to 1. This is an opportunity to share with our employees the importance of health and women's health. And as we talked about the tragic loss of one of our students, uh, this will be a time for all of our employees to get together, our female employees and male employees, because one of the things that many people don't focus on is breast cancer is not just a female issue, it is a male issue also. And so we will have uh, individuals there to educate and talk about the importance and also celebrate the importance of health. That concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you, City Manager. 
You think the city's not busy? We are quite busy. Thank you very much for that. And uh, for the entire council, on behalf of the entire council, congratulations to our new assistant uh, chief of police, uh, Freeze. It's getting a, it, I always, it's gonna, it was always easy for me to say Sergeant Freeze. Now it's going to be tough to say, but Chief Freeze. So congratulations on that. Moving on to item number two, uh, proclamations presentations. We have none, but we will go into our citizens' input at this time. Pursuant to section 551.007 of the Texas Government Code, any member of the public has the opportunity to address the City Council concerning any matter of public business or any posted agenda item. However, the Act prohibits the City Council from delivering any issues not on the public agenda, and such non-agenda issues may be referred to City staff for research and any future action. All persons addressing are subject to council adopted rules and limitations permitted by law. At this time, two minute comments will be accepted from individuals in the audience. And I also have some comments that have been submitted in writing that I will read as well. To address the council, we request that you have submitted a card and I have four cards that have been given to me. I will call on those individuals in the order that I received the cards. In accordance with the Texas Open Meetings Act, the city council cannot discuss issues raised or make any decisions at this time. Issues may be referred to city staff for research and possible future action. So the first individual uh, is Erica Browning. And please state your name and address for the record. And city secretary, um, I know this is fairly new for you, but uh, the timer is running both for the citizen and for yourself. I see that, correct? Thank you. Thank you. Erica Browning, 442 East Cherry Street. Um, I am grateful that during the briefing, our city manager suggested that we talk about the streetlight um, in a subsequent meeting and gave a date for that. And I'm wondering why that was not done when we requested an ordinance be put before the council for the nature preserve. We are waiting to hear something back and we are hearing crickets. So I would really like that to be put before the council um, as an ordinance that you all can vote on. We did a lot of work and we frankly feel like we're being ignored. And it's not that hard to go door to door again and fill this place up. Thank you. Thank you. Next individual is Nancy Gutierrez. Nancy Gutierrez, 730 Middell Road, Duncanville. Um, good evening, Mayor, Council. Uh, I would like to ask for you to please consider uh, putting the LAD property on the agenda for a vote to be designated a nature preserve. Uh, members of the Duncanville Nature Conservancy have previously informed us that uh, funds will come, but only when it's designated a nature preserve. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Emily Bridges. Hello, I'm sorry. There, I also sent in an email. Were those not accepted today? I have. Okay, just curious. I sent an email, so if you're going to read that, you can just read that and. Why don't you go ahead and do it verbally? It'd probably be better. Okay, well, I'll just read the email as it is. Does that work? Emily Bridges, 418 Oleander Street. Um, number one, most of you know that litter is a thorn in my side, as I have spoken about many times to not only my councilman, but to the council as well. Along that topic, I wanted to share that I observed one of our own at Armstrong Park with an orange grabber and litter in hand. He could have just chosen to walk empty handed, but he decided to do a little extra. And sometimes it's the little things that can make a big difference. Thank you to Chief Levigny. It was noticed and appreciated. Number two, Councilman Kuntz has started a new book club for kids that is very engaging where each month is a different topic, location. I need to just interrupt. Oh, yeah. by, by our rules of procedure, citizen comments do not, are not really address. permitted to address individuals. Okay. So if you want to eliminate a name okay. and Those are the use only a two pronoun names I had, so somehow, use no. a pronoun somehow, it would be better. Thank okay. you. Okay. So there is a book club that has started, as you've already heard. Um, it's very engaging for our kids. Um, as technology continues to take the front seat with most kids, it is important for us to find new creative ways to get them outdoors and to foster a love of reading. This is a great example of doing just that. We now have a group of children who have been introduced to Duncanville's historical park rather than just Kidsville. 
thank you to who's in charge of that and for choosing to do this for our kids as a private citizen. Number three, I shared at the last council meeting that the Lad Land hosted a homeschool group called Wild and Free South Dallas who plan on coming back because of what it has to offer for education. Now I want to share that the Lad Land has been located by Venture Academy Homeschool Co-op out of Fort Worth and they were on the, as they were on the hunt for Monarch Butterfly Studies. Update, there was plenty of it on the land. Future way station, perhaps both co-ops have plans on returning and I would doubt either of them, I'm sorry, spreading, I would doubt that either of them would not spread the word on its beauty. It is important to note that those who love all things nature will find it. I hope to see the proposed ordinance approved very soon as the community is waiting to claim Duncanville's nature preserve. It is really very special. Thank you. Thank you. Mark Graham. Uh, Mark Graham, 410 Santa Fe Trail. Um, just want to, uh, well, the question is why has this ordinance that was presented to you guys not been addressed? Um, Y'all directed a lot of work towards us, a lot of work towards us, to figure a way forward with this. We did it, way more than we probably should have. We were warned beforehand that, you know what, unless you get a nature preserve, none of this matters. We're sitting and waiting still for a nature preserve, which all it does is allow us to start raising funds to do things down there that need to be done. It in no way decides what is going to be done down there in the long run. All it will do is allow us to start work. And we're, there are things down there that need to be done now. We're picking up trash. After the flood, did the city come down and pick up anything? Not that I know of. We cleared wood, downed limbs from all over the place. Um, Tit for tat means something to me. We did a lot of work. You guys probably should address this sooner or later. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the final card I have is Mari Vega. Thank you. Uh, Mari Vega, 611 Oriole Boulevard, number 1004, Duncanville. Um, first, I want to acknowledge all y'all for all the time and effort that clearly you put into your jobs. Um, I got to become a school teacher this year, full time, and I put a lot of time and effort into it as well. Um, but I'm here again for the very uh, similar reason of urging y'all to get that ordinance uh, set up so that we can have that educational space and peacemaking space uh, that is good for all. I have with me seeds that my aunt sent from Hill Country that are blue bonnets and it comes with even like instructions and I have a bunch to share for anybody who would like to go to the lad land especially and plant blue bonnet seeds. These need to be scarified so when planting seeds, use the heel of your shoe to grind the seed into the soil. Grind it into the soil. And she's got a little boot drawing <laughs> that you grind it with your heel. Um, and I would love to give each and every one of you in the audience as well seeds to do that. Because this land, I personally don't get to go there very often. I'm a, a single individual who's not really anxious to go out into the, the wilderness by myself. Um, also, again, I'm preoccupied with, with my work, um, but I would make a special occasion to do this with y'all if you want to do that. Mark Graham, if he approves. <laughs> it's a joke. <laughs> um, and last thing, uh, if we can continue to do this thing with uh, the green branding of our city, I think it would be good for us, not just green washing, but if we can get a dark skies ordinance soon after the nature preserve, I think we're going to put ourselves on the map in a good way. Thank you. Thank you. The written comments that have been submitted 
first one is from Giver Cavello, 703 San Juan Drive. This is regarding the street lamp policy. I'm glad this is on the agenda. The street lamps in Duncanville are really far apart in many areas, especially in my area. I'm going to leave my residence on San Juan Drive in my electric wheelchair going north south on North Alexander towards Flamingo. It's dark for me. I take this way to Armstrong Park. I really hope putting up more street lamps is something that can be done. Thank you. Next one is from Thomas Lackey, 1818 Seabrook Drive. <clears throat> I'm writing the council to urge to adopt an ordinance that was submitted recently for consideration. This ordinance was in reference to the Ladd property that the city was given many years ago. The group of residents appointed by the council to partner with the city regarding the property continues to work with all stakeholders to responsibly get this project started. Sadly, as of yet, no action has been taken by the City Council regarding the crucial first step of simply codifying by ordinance that the property has been designated a nature preserve. The Council has tasked a group of Duncanville residents to work to provide a plan for oversight of this property and it is my honor to work with this group, now formerly known as the Duncanville Nature Conservancy Incorporated, to protect and enhance the property and promote its uniqueness and potential. Adoption of an ordinance by the City Council is critical for our plans. In action by the council stymies our plans to seek outside funding to make this gift to the city a world-class educational and cultural destination. I feel the citizens of Duncanville have made clear their desire to protect this land from commercial development. We have momentum and have begun the process of devising an overall strategy to make the property accessible, useful, and financially sustainable. But the city council must do its part, namely adopt an ordinance specifying that the property has been designated and will remain a nature preserve. Once the council takes this step, we will begin aggressively obtaining philanthropic financial support to carry out the wishes of the people of Duncanville. Please prioritize and finalize the adoption of an ordinance that designates the property as a nature preserve so that we may move forward. The next item is from Betty Taylor, 422 Oleander Street. Good evening, everyone. As a taxpaying citizen here in the city, I would like to address my concern as to why the city is allowing the candlelight area to go way down. There are cars that are being flipped and mechanic shops being run in this residential neighborhood. This has contributed to us not being able to travel safely down the streets of our neighborhood. Lastly, the Ladd property, we the citizens have made it very clear that we desire to have this property be deemed as a nature preserve. Can y'all please not go against us the citizens that have spoken on this matter for months? Is there any reasonable explanation as to why the council hasn't moved on this issue? Next item is from David DeRocca, 418 Oleander Street. Please have the mayor read my comments. Good afternoon. I want it to be put on record that it was almost one year ago that the citizens were first made aware of the property now known to most as the Ladd property. I have followed closely to what is and or is not being done in regards to the petition presented. During the briefing on 9-20-22, it was noted that the donor himself was in favor of preserve, which leaves us asking why. Why do we still not have one? Additionally, at that same briefing, an ordinance was proposed from the city appointed committee with the request for it to be put on an agenda from Councilman Kuntz. It is a beautiful piece of land with mass potential to bring people to our city. Are we going to miss the mark on that again? Is there any thought of developing it? I encourage you to do your homework on green spaces and what benefits parens as well as revenue closed parens they bring to a city. Please, I'd like to see a little forward thinking in Duncanville. Thank you for your time, David. Final item is from David and Heather Ripley. Our names are David and Heather Rip. I'm sorry, the address is 202 Willowwood Place. Our names are David and Heather Ripley. We are sorry we cannot attend tonight's meeting. However, we wanted to take the time to write to you so that our voice of concern could be heard. We join our voice with everyone who is present to express our concerns regarding the Ladd property and its hopeful designation as a nature preserve for us to enjoy now and for us to preserve for future generations. We are concerned that our petitions will be ignored and that our requests will be forgotten with empty promises for the future. Please hear the voice of Duncanville's residents. We want this property preserved for there's tremendous value in it. It would be a shame and a great loss to our community to let this place become developed. That closes our citizen comments. Moving on to item number three on our agenda. It's the consent agenda and city secretary will review 
we'll read the consent agenda items. I will note that at my request in accordance with the rules of procedure for the city of Duncanville, I have asked that item 4C be taken from the consent items to items for individual for consideration. So city secretary will not be reading item 4C. We will take that up as items for individual consideration. City secretary, please read the consent items. Thank you, Mayor. Item A, consider a resolution finding that Encore Electric Delivery Company LLC's application for approval to amend its distribution cost recovery factor to increase distribution rates within the city should be denied authorizing participation with Encore City Steering Committee, authorizing the hiring of legal counsel and consulting services, finding that the city's reasonable rate case expenses shall be reimbursed by the company, finding that the meeting at which this resolution is passed is open to the public as required by law, requiring notice of this resolution to the company and legal counsel. Item B, consider a resolution approving the terms and conditions of Professional Services Agreement 23-0004 with Dunaway Associates for the design of Softwood Drive Sanitary Sewer Aerial Crossing Repair in the amount of $84,800. Item D, consider a resolution approving the interlocal agreement between the City of Duncanville and, the Dal and Dallas County to provide highway accident investigation services in an amount not to exceed $59,000. Item E, consider adopting the council's rules and procedures. Thank you, City Secretary. Chair will maintain a motion to approve the consent. So item moved. Agenda. Second. We have a motion to approve and we have a second. Council, please vote. Thank you, we have unanimous approval of the consent items. Moving on to items for individual consideration. <coughs> Item 5A, conduct a public hearing for consideration and action regarding the request of Ted Straub, applicant, representing <coughs> Philip S. Nickel, Jr., owner to include a planned development, neighborhood office retail district on Irwin Keesler Development, Red Bird 4, Block 15A, Lot 1, Les Row and PT of ABND Tower Crest Drive, ACS 0.886 CALC, more commonly known as 700 West Camp Wisdom Road, Duncanville, Dallas County, Texas. Presenting, Mr. Nate Warren, City Planner. Mr. Warren. Thank you, Mayor, Council members. The request is a zoning change to allow development of a drive through coffee shop. The future land use map designation is retail commercial. Uh, current zoning district is neighborhood office retail district and the proposed zoning district is plan development district. So the modifications to the base NOR zoning regulations are allowance of a drive through exclusion of building articulation design standards, relief from buffer up screening requirements, and a 25-foot setback as opposed to the 30-foot setback in base NOR zoning regulations. This is an aerial showing the subject property of 700 West Camp Wisdom Road. This is a zoning map showing the base zoning subject NOR. Here's a picture showing the, uh, the sign of notice on the property. And here's a uh, notification uh, ma uh, map showing the uh, notices that were sent out to the property owners within 200 feet of the subject property. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Warren. Our policy with public hearings is that we will have the presentation by the staff member, which was just completed, and then we will open up the public hearing. Now, each of the sides for the public hearing have 10 minutes in the aggregate to present their positions. So it would be those in favor will have 10 minutes in the aggregate, and then we'll, I will call forward those who oppose it, and that individuals or those individuals have 10 minutes in the aggregate to present their position and then we will close the public hearing by a vote of the city council so with that opening the public hearing the time stamp on opening the public hearing is 7:43. so any individuals present who wish to speak in favor of this item please come forward
Seeing none, I'll close this portion of the public hearing for those in favor. I will now open this portion of the public hearing for those who are opposed. Please come forward. Please state your name and address. Mari Vega, 611 Oriole Boulevard, 1004 Duncanville. Um, this is a very strange little plot of land and it is, um, it backs up against a church that I used to belong to. Um, this is on a th big thoroughfare across the street from the high school. And um, I just, I've, it's an opinion that that space, I mean, this is my personal opinion, would be better served just to be like a wildflower plot. We've got uh, endangered honeybees that pollinate our food. It's an important thing. And they really don't get enough pollen because of how manicured our collective green spaces are. Our yards are so manicured. Um, and they're filled with flowers that are not native. Granted, European honeybees are not native either, but they have been adapted. And we count on them for pollinating our food supply. So they have to, we have to think about that. Um, we have wildflowers that are like almost endangered. We don't get to see them, they don't exist. Uh, I would further say, just reiterating, reiterating things that I read on social media, that the people of that neighborhood really don't, I can't imagine that kind of traffic flowing right through their, their front yard. So uh, again, wildflower plot, thanks. For listening. Thank you. Any other individuals present wish to oppose this? Seeing none, I'll chair to entertain a motion to close the public hearing. So second. We have a motion to close we have to we have a motion to close the public hearing and we have a second. Uh, the council please vote on closing the public hearing. Thank you. The public hearing is closed at seven forty five. At this point in time, we now open it up to discussion by the City Council. Uh, any questions or comments, Mr. Warren, if you'd please step back up. And uh, Mr. Contreras. Thank you, Mayor. Um, first, I'd just like to mention that I've got the, uh, the landscape uh, plan pulled up here. And I have to say that there are a number of native plants, while not all of them, uh, I've just lost it, sorry. Um, so it looks like there is an effort to have some native grasses along with some native plants. And uh, pretty much surrounding the property is a pretty good landscape buffer that includes these, uh, <coughs> some of the native grasses and um, plants. Uh, there are some traditional plants that aren't native, but I think there, there is more of an effort on this property than I see most, most often. So I do think they've made some effort to accommodate some of the more <laughs> natural ways of planting now. Um, my question specifically on, on the property itself have to do with um, the uh, line of sight coming out of uh, terror. Well, first off, the uh, where this portion that kind of jumps back uh, towards Tower Crest, and I trust that Tower Crest is going to become a driveway, and at least that portion is not going to be an public access for... Uh, That's correct. Okay. Um, and I noticed in there that um, there, uh, under number 17, which you don't have that in front of you, but uh, number 17 indicates that there's a one-way only. So if you come off of uh, Cedar Ridge and you're going uh, east, it seems as though there's still an opening to get onto Tower Crest, but, but yet you've got it marked with do not enter signs, but I don't see any gates or anything. What, what's going on there? Are you familiar with what I'm talking about? Yes, the uh, the ingress and egress of the of the property. So the, a portion of Tower Crest has actually been abandoned right. uh, uh, for uh, the opportunity to take a right turn directly onto Cedar Ridge Drive. And though, and that abandonment is the three lots that are actually one owned by the church right now. Is that correct? That's uh, well. It's the it's a portion of Tower Crest Drive. It's an actual street right of way. Right, right. But it's at the north end of those. Correct. Three it isn't. It is directly north of the three. Okay. Uh, so three it's right there lots. where this where this um, 
uh, unusual part of the drive-through area seems to still be open to Towercrest. Although it says you have two no entry signs posted on there. Is there gonna be a gate on there? Is that for like emergency vehicle access? What is that for? No, it, it wouldn't be for emergency access. Uh, it would be for the, um, we, don't, we don't have a slide that shows what he's describing. Okay, so, well, it, it's not, at the end of the day, it's not totally important. It's just an odd configuration there. You've got a, a, the remainder of Tower Crest, which is gonna remain a street for those residents, is <coughs> intersecting with a driveway that leads you to the drive-through with some type of a connection between the two, but it's limited. So there's, there wouldn't be, the, there wouldn't be a, a, a way to drive all the way through Tower Crest, it would be separated. It would be separated from the, uh, from the drive-through drive -through aspect. Okay. And then the rest by, of the by, residential. By a, by a gate of some sort? It would not be a gate. It would, there would not be a physical connected street. It would be a, a, a curb. Okay. A, well, the, the, uh, they show the curbs on both sides. They don't continue through, but I'm not gonna beat that to death. Uh, that, that was just curious to me more than anything. So coming out onto, uh, and I'm gonna go down to another one that you may not have in your, in your plan, it would appear that folks coming out of um, Tower Crest are still gonna be able to make a left-hand turn headed west on Camp Wisdom. Is that correct? I believe they would only be able to make a, a right-hand turn out of Camp Wisdom. We do have the, the, the applicant presence uh, t tonight, and they might be able to shed more light on that to, on If that they had more, question. and I don't know if the other members are able to see this, but this is gonna be on uh, one of the drawings. No, well, this one, the one that's up there right now kind of shows it, but there's a, a more detailed drawing, an architectural drawing uh, that I'm looking at. But, but on the on the far right hand of that blue uh, light blue light line, there is an island across Camp Wisdom right there where it does allow you to make a left hand turn. And why I'm mentioning that is I'm just concerned where that's an open field right now, so you have a clear view. And all of us know that that stretch of Camp Wisdom uh, during the school hours, cars are far exceeding the speed limits. And I I, I think the police would agree that they're they're in a hurry coming or going down there. So I'm, I'm worried about the, um, we're planting a number of trees along there, starting from the very point of that corner of that property, we're planting a number of trees. Uh, I realize that they'll be probably at a certain height, so you may be able to see under them. But has anybody really looked at that? Because there's a curve in the road right there uh, on, the, on the eastbound lanes. It's a curve from Camp Wisdom to that entryway of Tower Crest. And with those cars coming, if there's any obscuring of their visibility, um, we're, out. we're sorry to interject, but we're we're saying that going eastbound on Camp Wisdom, correct? Eastbound on Camp Wisdom, approaching the Tower Crest exit onto Camp Wisdom. If you're coming off of Tower Tower Crest Drive, you can then it's shown in the drawing that you have up on the screen right now. Yes. You can make a left-hand turn right there. You can see the island. So. What I'm what I'm asking is anybody did anybody on the in the public work side, as they were this was all being designed, do any type of visibility study to make sure that the planting of those trees, while they're welcomed, don't obscure the visibility because they're going to be coming at upwards of 50, 55 miles an hour when they're coming through there when that light turns. And these folks, if they can't have a clear view the way they have it right now, um, they're going to be putting themselves at a little bit of risk. Uh, making that left-hand turn. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that we don't have a left-hand turn. I'm more curious whether anybody during the discussions talked about the loss of that visibility coming out of that area of Tower Crest there. I'm gonna leave that as a question. Um, it's not gonna affect the outcome of my vote tonight, uh, but I just, I, I'm concerned about the rate of speed that I know they come down Camp Wisdom and that visibility issue that could come up. Um, so it's something I'd like to have somebody at least look at if it hasn't been looked at already. And then the uh, last question. Um, that's it. You got off easy. That's all I got. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Mr. You. Contreras, uh, is it then so your suggestion, uh, I understand that you do 
um, understand the entire aspects of this particular project, uh, but asking the, the city manager um, look have someone on staff examine the possibilities of what the maybe the possibility of precluding a left-hand turn coming out of Terra Crest well, going if it's west. If it's deemed necessary, again, this might That's be a discussion saying, between the police department, engineering, uh, and the folks that handle our traffic. Right. Uh, because we do have uh, what's called the visibility triangle when there's 90 degree uh, intersections. And if somebody had a shrub or a tree that obscured the visibility when you're trying to look left to turn left, they would have to yeah. cut that down. So city so, manager, would yes. you just make a note of that and have uh, an appropriate staff take a look at that? What we would do is just, uh, when we're working with them on their landscape design, is ensure that there is no uh, obstruction of visibility uh, within that radius that's required. And so we'll review as they start to present. Uh, if it's shrubs or just flowers, they would be low, but we would make sure it adhered to that. Mm -hmm. And then we'd also continue to monitor it and see if, as it's developed, if it's necessary that we make that a a right turn only and you have to go back around if we see that's a yeah. busy time especially during school hours what you can do is do a time frame right turn only and then during other times you have the ability to do left sure thank you and the applicant is present tonight as i understand it yes so that applicant is hearing this discussion and understands our concerns as well okay very good thank you uh mr mac Burnett. thank you mayor um i had a lot of the same concerns as mr Contreras. um the, the one slide that we have that's not on the on the presentation and and I appreciate your presentation mr. Warren but I'm, I'm trying to understand it because when I when I look at what it's saying it's they come in on tower crest and they and they come back around and I'm, I'm wondering how the traffic's queued and and and, and that line and that might be more for uh, your applicant because uh, I think it'd be real helpful if everybody got to see the the full view of, of what it looked like and stuff so I, I'm curious of how this is gonna flow and and I'm also curious of, of whether there's been uh, when when there was something previously that was proposed here and I, I believe it's the same group that's 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 doing this I don't know that for certain, but I but I think that it is, and I had them actually meet with the neighbors. So I'm wondering if there's been any contact with the neighbors, and and the concerns of of this as well. So that might be for the applicant to yeah. to to answer. So I, I'd appreciate if you came up. And please state your name and address for the record, please. Wyatt Pop with Olson, 4700 Tennyson Parkway, Plano, Texas. And I'll, I'll start with your last question first. So we did some public engagement, door-to-door -door activities, and we, um, we had some favorable response to the, to the project, and we had a some negative response as well, but more favorable than negative. To your question on the alignment, I believe, of Tower Crest, and it sounds like your question as well is, is very similar. Is it the question of what that alignment looks like and the purpose of that that configuration? Is that yeah? So uh, I appreciate that and and the the intent there is we were working with city staff on the limiting of the traffic that would be coming through on Tower Crest, and that that drive is then reduced there to that one way access. And that is for the fire department's um, ultimate service of the of the property. So, that was in conjunction with city staff to come up with that alignment. Can you talk about the building and and, and where it's located, and then also how what the distance would be from the the building and and to the houses? I don't recall the dimension off the top of my head, but the, the building is located generally on the plan left side, closer to Cedar Ridge, and then it is further north, closer to Camp Wisdom. It, it appears it's about 800 square foot. Does that sound about right? And forgive me, I don't remember the, the exact square footage off the top of my head either, but it is a, a smaller structure in nature. 
Mr. Warren, do you under, uh, I think it was 855 square feet, something like that? It is, 755. It is less than 700 755, yeah. Okay. I, don't, I don't have any further questions, Mayor. This is okay. m much like Mr. Contreras, the, the safety concern becomes more of an issue for, okay. for me. Uh, I, uh, this might be a question for Mr. Warren or, or, or for you, sir, but I'm but my question was still is like a, how far is the building from the residence and, and I, I, I'd like to know that uh, you know if, how is this going to impact the residence yeah so the placement was ideally for visibility for the business itself but then there is consideration for the the drive-through component of the, the facility So do, do any of you know how far the building's gonna be from the first house? So, I, I, don't, have the, I don't have an aerial with me, so. I'll, I'll answer. Yeah. So the property, the proposed location of the uh, actual structure is about as far as away as possible from the uh, single family structures as can be located, it's as far west towards uh, Cedar Ridge Drive and as far, just about as far north uh, towards Camp Wisdom as possible, uh, being 25 feet set back um, from right. Cedar from the property line uh, on Cedar Ridge Drive. It is a very small structure. Uh, it is only drive-through in nature. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a small drive-through coffee shop uh, with the, um, with that's the, the kind of the business model of the uh, of the intent for the proposed uh, plan development district the zoning change okay so m maybe I need to ask this question then so how far is the 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 traffic coming through how far is the traffic from the first house the traffic the cars would be closer than the than the structure the the uh, I think what you're terrible to see on on the document of the stacking in the case report uh, shows where the where the cars are in relationship to the to the structures to the residential structures and how much stacking is 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 shown in this or how much stacking would there be I don't have that number uh, do you, do you committed know? to memory So I believe the diagram showed about 10 vehicles there in that actual drive-through lane, but then the component of Tower Crest that was vacated can also serve as additional stacking if necessary. And then there's also a parking component that's just to the north there. Okay, thank you. Mr. Coons. Uh, thank you, Mayor. And these are just my general thoughts just for the rest of the council. I, I had one or two concerns coming into this and now hearing some of the comments from other councilmen I have, now I have some other concerns but I guess my primary concern was with the proximity to the high school and uh, we, I've, I've been in that area during pickup and drop off uh, before and after school and it's a pretty busy area and you got a lot of kids walking uh, especially in the mornings I would imagine uh, there are going to be a lot of cars using the drive through if it's primarily a drive through um, and so I guess my, my primary concern is just with, with a lot of the kids walking uh, that area uh, and with you know, drive through coffee shop, I mean, they get, get a lot of cars in there. So now we got extra congestion. So uh, those are my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Contreras, is your light back on? Yes, sir. Uh, just for your information, uh, you took about eight and a half minutes of your 10 minutes that you were allotted by rules procedure, so. Okay, I'm gonna, Careful, take, I'm gonna take 30 seconds. Yes, please, thank All you. Right. Um, I wanna piggyback off of uh, what uh, uh, Councilman Kuntz just said, and it, it's not to the detriment of where I'm gonna go with this vote, but trying to monitor those kids that are coming from the high school, running across, trying to grab a cup of coffee on foot. Um, they're not gonna use the crosswalks per se, because we've seen, as, as uh, Councilman Kuntz uh, alluded to, during pickup time, um, very few are using crosswalks. They're, they're jumping across every 
stretch of uh, road that they have along there. So it's just something we're going to have to deal with, and uh, the police and the school district police are going to have to deal with it if it becomes a, a traffic hazard on Cedar Ridge and, and a life safety issue. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, seeing no other further comments, uh, I would just say that we personally, I am pleased to see an opportunity to make some commercial land available for some uh, property tax and sales tax as well. Uh, this has been a difficult plot of land in order to occupy for some type of retail. And I congratulate the applicant for, and engineers for considering how to put this together. And seeing uh, that, yes, it is necessary to, to a, a high school and the behavioral issues of students are something that we cannot control. Uh, that being said, and understanding that, as Mr. Contreras said, it's going to be an issue for uh, the Duncanville Independent School Districts for their police department to uh, will look at the behavior of their students and possibly in conjunction with our city in terms of what it needs to be uh, addressed. But I am thankful that this can come forward to council and we can see that there is a good possibility. I see this as a positive, positive uh, addition to our commercial retail in our city. Uh, with that, um, I'll take a motion to approve. Make the motion to approve. We have a motion to approve. Is there a second? I will second the motion. Council, please. Was there a second or was there not a second? Mr. Kuhn seconded. Mr. Kuhn seconded. I did not hear that. Okay. Thank you. Council, please vote. Uh, the vote is a six to one. Mr. Kuhn's dissenting. Thank you. Moving on to item 5B, conduct a public hearing for consideration and action regarding the request of Tisha Lewis, applicant and owner, to include a specific use permit, SUP, for short-term rental on Huntington Park First, Block A, Lot 1, more commonly known as 919 Green Hills Road, Duncanville, Dallas County, Texas. Mr. Warren. Thank you, Mayor. The request is to allow a short-term rental at the petition address. The future land use mag des designation is low-density residential. The zoning district is single-family 13, single-family residential district. The code and section requirements pertain to section 3.04B8, in which short-term rental uh, standards are defined as a residential unit offered for rental to guests for residential purposes for a period of one to 30 nights. Examples include, but are not limited to, Airbnb, HomeAway, and other brokers. Such rentals may include a shared room, a single room, or the entire dwelling unit between a homeowner and a tenant. The short-term rental permit must be obtained and proof of ownership must be provided. Short-term rentals must obtain the SUP in all residential and uh, office. Excuse me, Mr. Warren. Uh, members, yes. of, members of the audience, you are distracting from the presentation. Thank you. Continue, Mr. Warren, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Short-term rentals may are not permitted in commercial and industrial districts, and they are allowed by right in downtown districts. Here's the DCAD uh, uh, image showing that the property is just north of Big Stone Gap Road, east of South Clark Road. Here's an aerial of the subject property on 919 Green Hills Road. You can see the uh, subject property, the pool in the back. This is the zoning map showing that it is uh, residential in nature. This is an image of the property with the notice uh, zoning pinning uh, sign out front. Here's a uh, s title survey showing the, uh, the layout of the property with the Green Hill Road and uh, Big, S Big Stone Gap Road uh, being on the south and east. 16 mailings were sent out. We had zero replies in favor. Uh, four of the 16 mailings that were sent out uh, replied not in favor. And we had 20 total responses not in favor. Now, because we had four of 16 mailings uh, replied not in favor, a three-fourths vote of council is required to approve uh, this request per Article 6, Section 6.02 of the Comprehensive Zoning Ordinance. 
Uh, we have a few provisions and conditions for consideration that were uh, mentioned at the Planning and Zoning Commission that no loud or ruckus noises between the hours of 10 p.m. and 7 a.m. would be allowed. The SUP would be removed if the location receives three sustained complaints from neighboring property owners for excessive noise or traffic within a 24-month period. The property must continue to be in good standing by not having any outstanding issues related to taxes or code compliance provisions. A report must be submitted to planning staff each January that indicates the following, the number of nights the unit was rented as a short-term rental in the previous year, proof of payment of hotel occupancy tax, and proof of current property insurance. The property will be suspended or removed from the registration list for one year if false or misleading information is provided, there has been a violation of the terms, conditions, or restrictions, or if the hotel occupancy tax has not been paid in a timely manner. Continued operation of a short-term rental following sus suspension or removal from the registration list will be considered a violation of the City of Duncanville's Comprehensive Zoning Ordinance. The Planning and Zoning Commission recommendation uh, was to approve the item by a vote of five to one. Thank you, Mr. Warren. We now open this for a public hearing. As in the past, as I already stated, the policy is we will open the public hearing, but there will be 10 minutes in the aggregate for those individuals in favor followed by 10 minutes in the aggregate for those individuals opposed. Closing the public hearing, we'll then open this up for council discussion. So with that, I'm opening the public hearing for this item. The time will be 8-10. So all those in favor of this item, please come forward. Please state your name and address for the record. Thank you. Taisha Lewis, 919 Green Hills Road, Duncanville. Um, so this is my property. My husband and I have owned and raised our children in this home for the last nine years. We have a 17-year-old son, a 14-year-old daughter, and a five-year-old son. And it's our intention to keep this home in our family so that our children can also have the option of raising their families in this home. We've decided to pursue the short-term rental route instead of the long-term rental route because we still would like use of the property whenever we have friends or family that do come in town that need a place to stay. We've also selected this route because when we travel with our family of five, we often look for Airbnb locations um, or short-term short -term rental locations because it gives us the option of the entire family being together as opposed to us having to rent two separate hotel rooms and separating. And that being done that way also allows us uh, the option to buy and store groceries, snacks, things of that nature, so we don't have to dine out for all of our meals. So we would like to offer the same opportunity for those that are uh, coming to the Duncanville area. As a benefit to local communities, short-term rentals also help to generate more economic opportunities for local businesses. So it's our intention to also provide a guide that would um, share with the visitors um, some of our local area businesses, restaurants, things of that nature, so they could patronize those establishments. Um, I would also like to mention that this is the only short-term rental that my husband and I will have. We're not in the business of going out and purchasing properties with the intention of, of having a short-term rental business. Um, we have also noticed that there's a need for short-term housing with families that uh, require transitional ho housing. So in the event that they've purchased a new property and there's a delay between when they've sold their home and when they're able to move into their new home, whether it's a new construction or what have you. And so we would like to also market um, that demographic as well that's looking for transitional housing. We also have a daughter that's a competitive dancer and a son that's in elite football. And so with that, we travel often. Again, when we do travel in that way, we also look for Airbnb or short-term rental locations. And so we want to be able to market to those that are coming into our area for those types of needs as well. Um, I did wanna share a little bit about the rules and policies that we would like to put in place just to ensure um, that this is done the right way. We won't allow any smoking or illegal activities anywhere on the premises. Uh, we will be um, putting a $500 fine in place for things of that nature. No pets allowed, no parties, no large gatherings, no DJs. Um, we also are requiring all guests to be registered and requiring all outdoor music to be turned off no later than 10 p.m. nightly, no outdoor 
um, no loud noises, excuse me, after 10 p.m. Our neighborhood is a very quiet one, so it is not our intention at all to tolerate any noise disruptions. If authorities are called, then we will be asking the visitors, the guests, to uh, vacate the premise without refund. Um, so we hope that this gives you a clear understanding of why we'd like to pursue using our home as a short-term rental. We've absolutely loved our time here in Duncanville, especially our time in Huntington Park. Our children have precious memories with friends, trips to the parks with their cousins. Um, our oldest is graduating from Duncanville High School this year, and also our five-year-old is in love with Armstrong Park. Uh, we've built relationships with families in our neighborhood, um, our next door neighbors, um, of course, checking on each other when storms uh, happened, when our power went out, we shared firewood with each other. My son's sixth grade teacher lives diagonal to where we live. Um, I mention all of that to say that we would never do anything to jeopardize the quality of life for our neighbors. Um, we're also prepared to make our contact information available to the community. So anyone can reach out to us directly if for some reason there is a disruption being caused on the property. Um, this will always be home to us and we'd love to share some of why we love the city with visitors, but we only wanna do it the right way. Thank you. Thank you. City Secretary, how much time is left in 10 minutes? Five minutes. Any, any other individuals wishing to speak in favor? Seeing none, we'll open the floor to those individuals who wish to speak in opposition. Seeing none, the chair will entertain a motion to close the public hearing. Closed. We have a motion to close. Second. We have a second. Council, please vote on closing the public hearing. Thank you, the council. Public, public hearing is closed at 8.15. Mr. Warren. Mr. Warren. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Not done yet. Not done yet. <laughs> uh, go back to slide 57, please. Okay, 56. Okay. In the electronic item that has been provided uh, from the agenda, I noticed only one input, um, and it was not in favor. And so looking at this, you're saying that there were uh, 20 total responses not in favor, but those aren't indicated in terms of any physical evidence that we have in the electronic item. All we have is this one. In fact, looking at the minutes from uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission, uh, this individual who was opposed after hearing the applicant speak, that individual withdrew uh, the, uh, the opposition. So I'm concerned that we see only one in opposition, which essentially after the PNZ Commission heard that applicant that was withdrawn so where are these others and what did anybody did they send in information did they give their name and address or where are these op these ones in opposition y yes so these uh responses in opposition uh were sent to us uh in the 11th hour uh they were they were brought together all at once and i was uh, able to uh from our uh, planning technician was able to gather them and, and get them to me and i was able to uh, see where all the responses came from. Uh, out of the 20, only four were within the 16 mailings that came that came out. So uh, what I suspect is that there was an individual who may have knocked on doors and gotten the support of, of friends in the area of, and, um, and, and brought 20 responses uh, in, in opposition. So what I'm hearing you saying is that several of the responses that came in at the 11th hour were not within the 200 foot radius of where the original mailing went 16 out. to be exact. Okay, okay. All right. Another question, uh, Mr. Contreras, your light. Yeah, well go ahead, no, I may continue, but go ahead, yes. <laughs> you got <t> down. <laughs> okay, just uh, real quick. I, I want to tell the the applicant. I, I, I'm I'm blown away by your presentation. It's what we. I think it's what I want to hear from people in terms of having an investment in Duncanville and maintaining that attitude that just because you're leaving doesn't mean you 
don't care about Duncanville. So you said a lot of right things to me. I, um, you answered all my questions too, I have a bunch. And so you saved the council a lot of, a lot of uh, nitpick time for me. Um, in terms of what's in your contract that would, would keep people from having opportunities to bring in, the only thing I didn't hear was a, um, something to limit the number of visitors so that you don't get that party atmosphere. And I didn't see that built in there. Given your presentation, I'm not gonna be concerned about that. Normally, uh, when I have this many letters of opposition, which thank you, Mayor, for bringing it to our attention that, um, that we had this, I always listen to those complaints. That's important to me. The problem is here is you've met all the criteria for a, for a um, in my opinion, you've met all the criteria <coughs> for this type of housing, um, and uh, and you've presented well. So even though we might have those those 20 out there, I'm not ignoring them, but I, I don't see this as a threat, and I'll be voting in support of this um, based on what I've seen in comparison to some other requests that we've had and some other short-term rental bad experiences that we've heard about. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Harvey. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I want to echo uh, what Council Member Contreras has said uh, from the vantage point and perspective that I also am a property owner of rental property in Hollywood Park. And as uh, the lady spoke about her uh, passion and her commitment to the neighborhood, it resonated with me because I feel the very same way about the property that I have in, in Hollywood Park. I may not physically live there, but I am there in spirit and I care very deeply about that neighborhood and, and my former neighbors that are there. So yes, I do uh, support her petition and I wish her well. Thank you. Any further comments from council <laughs> discussion? Seeing none, Chair will entertain a motion to approve. Motion to approve. Second. We have a motion to approve, Mr. McManette, a second by Mr. Harvey. Council, please vote. We have unanimous approval. Thank you. Um, following on that, the, what you have heard, Mr. and Mrs. Lewis, I presume, uh, is unique because we have had some discussions here where there's been great opposition to short-term rentals. However, knowing your concern for our city, we do appreciate that. And that's that convincing as well as, I'm look, as I said, I looked at the P&Z Commission uh, that that hearing was held and that your presentation convinced that individual who was in opposition to withdraw that opposition. So with that, we congratulate you and we'll be watching. Take care of it, thank you. Item 5C, consider amending the code of ordinances by an amending chapter 12, miscellaneous offenses and provisions, article 13, secondary medical recyclers by amending section 12-256, definitions by adding the definition of catalytic converter and by adding a new section 12-260A, possession of catalytic converter. Chief Levigny, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, thank you for uh, allowing us to discuss this item and present it tonight. Um, the city manager um, mentioned this earlier. I had planned on doing it, to do it before Assistant Chief uh, Chris Freeze presented this item. Uh, but uh, thank you, city manager. But um, I would like to take this minute to introduce uh, Assistant Chief Chris Freeze uh, to present this item to you. Chris has been with us for over 12 years. He's a very dedicated member of our department. We have a lot of talent in our department. And um, as you'll see shortly and uh, in the coming uh, time, um, as uh, he works in that role, uh, Chris is very deserving and we expect good things of Assistant Chief Chris Rees. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Mayor, Council, City Manager, thank you for having me tonight. Um, as the Chief uh, stated earlier, I bring before you 
uh, the consideration of amending our current ordinance, uh, making it unlawful to possess catalytic converter, uh, a catalytic converter that's been removed from a vehicle. So we'll start off by talking about what is a catalytic converter. A catalytic converter is a device on vehicles that is designed to convert the environmentally hazardous exhaust emitted by an uh, engine into less harmful gases. Vehicle catalytic converter thefts nationwide and the cost of owners. Um, you can see the rise from 2019 to 2020, month over month. Um, this data is brought to us by the NCIB. Um, the cost to replace and install a new catalytic converter is up to $3,000. Um, and that's according to, um, and that's with insurance. That's according to the Highway Loss Data Institute. So why are vehicle catalytic converters thefts rising? So the first and foremost, like everything else, it's money. Um, vehicle catalytic converters contain three to 10 grams of precious metals, depending on the make and model. Our recyclers will pay anywhere between 50 to $300 per catalytic converter that they're able to get. Um, the extraction of precious metals from the devices can be dangerous and time consuming without proper equipment and knowledge. Professional scrap recovery services have both. It's also the ease of theft. Um, I'm sure if you look on YouTube, you can go online and you can see that these things can be taken off within minutes. Um, they're easily stolen and use of reciprocating saw and battery operated tools. Also, there's currently right now, there's no ability to track them. Criminal enterprises can make more money extracting the metal. Scrap metal retailers often have equipment and expertise to extract precious metals used in the devices. Due to the scarcity and ability to speed chemical reactions while maintaining their stability, the precious metals used in catalytic converters are palladium, platinum, and rhodium. And as you can see by the uh, amounts there, they are very, very valuable. So catalytic converter thefts in Duncanville. 2021, January 1 to June 30th, we had 44. From January 1st, December 31st of 2021, there were 113. This year, January 1 to June 30th, there were 62. Uh, in May, there were 38 converters stole from, stolen from U.S. Uh, Postal Service vehicles in Dallas, Lancaster, and Duncanville. Um, one of our night shift officers actually caught um, this theft ring just due to excellent police work when they were responding to an unrelated call. Um, and they were able to conduct a traffic stop, find evidence that they had freshly stolen some catalytic converters, um, worked with the U.S. Postal Service, and they were able to um, make several arrests within that. Um, numbers that are updated on the slide from J uh, July 1st to date, we've had an additional 29 thefts for 91 thefts year to date. So headlines around the county, around the country, um, one from Fox News uh, 51 in August, uh, Texas alleged got a convert theft ring busted, item stolen worth uh, $2.7 million. In Oregon, police busted a multi-state ring in the amount of $22 million. Um, in Texas, task force of bus catalytic converter theft ring with 12 million in stolen goods and guns. And then I'm sure everybody remember the headlines from the Harris County um, deputy that was shot whenever he was exiting a store and he saw somebody trying to steal his own personal catalytic converter. So the question that we're always getting is what can be done to help curb prevent these thefts? So state legislator uh, enacted some measures in 2021 that makes um, for secondhand metal recyclers the purchase of Catalytic converters without proper documentation is actually a felony. Um, vehicle manufacturers are currently looking at making catalytic converters less accessible. Um, that's going to take time. That's not a quick fix right now. And different municipalities are doing what we're doing now, coming to you to try to enact local ordinances to provide more tools for the police departments in order to take action. Um, Humble and Frisco, uh, they both have now made it illegal to possess or sell catalytic converters without appropriate documentation. So as I stated earlier, what I'm bringing, we're bringing for you today is to amend the current ordinance to make the mere possession of severed or unbolted catalytic converters unlawful without the appropriate documentation. Thank you, and I'll take your questions. Thank you, Chief. Curious question in terms of the effort that our local police department has done in terms of inscribing and or etching the catalytic converters. Is there any evidence that that is actually precluding individuals from, from taking a, a catalytic converter that has that etching or painting on it? So what's that, what that helps is on the back end. If something is stolen, um, the person who has their catalytic converter etched, they can let the police department know, hey, VIN number, the license plate's been etched on it, we can put that in the report, and then we can then track it from there. Um, I don't know if there's any evidence right now of just the mere of that fact being etched that's going to prevent anything, but that helps us on the back end try to track it down. 
Okay. So our resolution making it illegal to possess a removed catalytic converter, what is the ability of law enforcement to enforce what we're doing to say that I'm walking around with a catalytic converter and I say, well, it came off of my car and I'm going to do something with it. What is the process in terms of, as I said, in adequate enforcement so that law enforcement doesn't get stymied by trying to stop someone? If we, if we try to, if we enact this, is enforcement really effective and possible? I would say absolutely, yes, sir. So right now with the current ordinance that we're presenting to you, the mere possession of a catalytic converter that's been removed from a vehicle is unlawful. As it states right now, it's not unlawful to possess an unbolted or removed catalytic converter. It's unlawful to purchase one. Um, so like the, the officer that was able to stop the vehicle back in May, um, that driver was actually arrested for traffic violations, not for the possession of a catalytic converter. Now through the evidence they located in the vehicle, they were able to obtain uh, a warrant and go down that route. But this is going to make it a lot easier because just the mere possession of the catalytic converter is going to be unlawful without having to go down the road of saying, okay, now we've located tools, evidence to the crime, it's been unbolted, get a judge to sign the warrant. There's just the mere possession of it is going to be unlawful. Yeah, my, my concern is that this has teeth to it. Yes, sir. You know, that our law enforcement officers, when they encounter something like this, can they're un, they are enabled to take positive action against the offender. Yes, sir. There was no, just not something in paper that we're putting together. Okay, yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Coons. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, so, first of all, um, so I, you, you can add me to that percentage of people <laughs> that, that, that have had you know, been victims of that. And I really appreciate the, the etching program that we have. Uh, and, and mine was taken in broad daylight at the high school, and it was in the afternoon. So um, you know, I'm really glad to see this, uh, anything that we can do. Uh, my, my question is, do, do we see a lot of, uh, I'm not sure how to put it, where these the stolen converters are processed, uh, you know, processed here, where the materials are removed here in Duncanville, or do they typically uh, remove them and then take them somewhere else? Yeah, I would say probably somewhere in Dallas, but we don't have any metal recyclers here in Duncanville, so they're being removed from Duncanville, but they're taking them to other locations. Thank you. Yes, sir. Mr. Contreras. Uh, that answered my question because I'm wondering if we had any second de secondary recyclers, and we don't. And um, so this ordinance, the, the real teeth in this ordinance is, has to do with um, being able to arrest somebody just for the mere possession. Yes, sir. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Vera Cruz. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, so a couple of questions. What are our local or surrounding cities? Do they have ordinances like this in place already? I'm not sure. I know Frisco just enacted one. I know Humble has one. As far as our sister cities, I'm not entirely sure. Okay. And then uh, secondly, I saw on one of the slides preventive measures. Uh, do we hand that out? I, you probably do during the etching, but do we do that any other time, Mr. City Manager, that you know of? If you could go back to a couple of slides. Right there. So avoiding becoming a victim. Can we get that out maybe electronically Absolutely. in the water bill? Uh, Alex is looking up there now. I think yeah. that uh, we will start on a campaign because we have had employees as well as council members. And it's really just an education process. Most don't recognize it's a problem until it happens to right. them. And so uh, we will make sure that that's on our website. And we also will add some more information about this in our next water bill uh, mailing also just to make sure citizens get the information. Thank you very much. Congratulations, by the way. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Seeing no additional comments from council, chair will entertain a motion to approve. Motion to approve. Second. Motion to approve by Mr. McMurray, second by Mr. Harvey. Council, please vote. Thank you, unanimously approved. Thank you. Item 5D. Consider an ordinance amending Chapter 19, Traffic, Article 6, Stopping, Standing, and Parking, Section 19-116, No Parking and or Placement of Oversized Vehicles, Storage Unit, Cargo Container, or Recreational Vehicle on City Streets by Repealing Section 19-116, No Parking and or Placement of Oversized Vehicles, Storage Unit, Cargo Container, or Recreational Vehicle on City Streets in its entirety, 
and replacing it with a new section 19-116, no parking and or placement oversized vehicle storage unit car container recreation vehicle on city streets. Chief Levigny. Thank you, Mayor. Let me just back up just a second. I know y'all approved that and thank you very much. It's another tool in the toolbox. You know, it helps us because we have to get to a point if we see something, we can act on it on a traffic stop. Before y'all have approved that, we might have to take different measures. And I know of one ish, one instance where uh, the etching has prevented the the theft. They started to saw into it. They saw it and they knew. If I take this somewhere, I'm not going to be able to sell it. Still had an inconvenience, but I just wanted to kind of answer those questions. Assistant Chief Freeze did a great job. Uh, but I just kind of didn't want to interrupt him. I just want to follow up with that. So thank you. Uh, this particular ordinance, we get a lot of complaints on uh, smaller trailers. I'm not talking about the 18-wheeler trailers, but we, we, we get from time to time some complaints about those parked in residential areas. And then when our officers go out, we've got several uh, different ordinances that there's trailers as well as tractor trailers listed in these ordinances it can be a little confusing even for our people. We're trying to get some clarity to our folks to be able to respond uh, more responsibly. We also have some of the smaller trailers that are maybe lawn companies and things like this that they're there for a short time. So we want to be equitable in the way that we deal with the complaints we get. So um, Basically, uh, our current ordinance, 19-116, uh, limits trailer parking on city streets. Um, again, I, as I just went through, I'm talking about the smaller trailers, some homemade trailers, boat trailers, uh, small enclosed trailers. Sometimes it, we believe that there may be some citizens that we've responded to time to time. Maybe they're working uh, uh, a business from the house, but we, it, it's difficult to prove that. It takes a little bit of time. Um, and they're using these trailers to do so. Uh, I, th I think some of the neighbors believe that the trailers are an eyesore to their neighborhood. And we just, again, want to get some clarity. So 19115, as you can see there, uh, seems to make leaving parking, standing trailer, non-residential zones. So different ordinances, but it leaves enough in there that say uh, this could apply, that could apply. We're just looking for some, clar some clarity. So defenses on this one, and we're basically talking about 18 wheelers. And talking with the city attorney, uh, Mr. Hager, uh, we worked through this, and he and I have been around enough. He wrote some of these maybe before I was here, but I know I've worked with him on some of these ordinances before. And again, even though in several of these ordinances talk about trailers, 15 um, addresses the, the more of the 18-wheeler trailers. Um, again, going back to 16, what we're looking to do is just, again, get the clarity, make a determination from the council, is this okay? Uh, do we wanna leave this in here? Do we wanna you know, have these affirmative defenses that are already listed or uh, for these smaller trailers, do we want to do something else? Um, if we want to do something, there's a, there's a way that we can amend this and that Mr. Hager's already advised on. Some of the examples and uh, pictures are worth a thousand words. So some of the examples, um, and, and not all these pictures are from Duncanville, but we've seen these, uh, some of these pictures uh, uh, all in Duncanville. I know, I know we have, but let's see, one, two, I believe three of them are from Duncanville. Um, but those are some of the things that I, I, I'm speaking of. Are we good with this? Do we want to look to amend this ordinance so we have more clarity and we can deal with these? If they're parking, you know, past a certain time period, then we could more swiftly deal with them rather than have officers saying, well, does this apply, that apply? And then we have, we have to talk and try to negotiate you know, what we're trying to get to here. So there's the consideration, amend 19.116 to prohibit trailer parking on residential streets, again, the small trailers, with some defenses as proposed by the city attorney. Uh, basically, city streets between 11 
p.m. and 7 a.m. Understand that this may, uh, you know, as many ordinances, this is not something that uh, potentially we could be certainly proactive, but this is going to be more complaint-based um, because, you know, we've talked about it. We've got a lot of different priorities, and uh, we will answer every call. And we'll evaluate every call, but the way 19116, right now, if we do nothing, um, if it falls within those dimensions, and we've gone out and, and measured vehicles before, we move on. So that's, that's what's before us. Uh, any questions? Yeah. Chief, go back to, I think, where the, the photographs were, 76. That bottom right photo is, I guess we would call that an RV. A recreational vehicle. It's smaller one. Trailer. The, it's on a trailer, smaller one. Yep. So, with the revised ordinance, what would law enforcement do if there's a received a complaint about that particular item? If it's past 11 o'clock, we, we would have the ability to, to move that. Understand that's, that's not something that's been actively used. Um, and that is, um, you know, you know, you can take some of these ordinances, and, and especially with parking, and we've tried. Um, but we're trying to be focused on this particular area. Again, there's an RV that's clearly not being used. It's parked out on the street, uh, apparently, and that's one that's not from Duncanville. But we have seen those types before. Um, but, yeah, past 11 o'clock, we would, we would have the ability to move it. It's, you know, my concern is that here again we don't, overburden our law enforcement with, well, this, and again, with something um, like this. And, and, and again, we it, do get the calls right now. We get yeah. the complaints. Uh, I'm not, I'm not going to stand up here and tell you that we're going to be able to, to deal with everyone on every residential street. We have priorities, and there are a lot higher priority calls in this, not that this quality of life issue and, and the, you know, the optics to a neighborhood is not important, but I don't want to give anybody the illusion that we're going to go out and enforce every one of these from day one. That's all we're going to do. We don't have that ability. So a follow-on, I guess, and I'm, now I'm coming from a personal observation. In the normal travels of our law enforcement individuals in their, in their vehicles, if they see something like this, and there's no complaint filed by a citizen, would they overlook it, or are they going to take action to enforce? You know, there's always... Let me, uh, let me, I'll tell you why, because there, there, there's one particular... Um, in my neighborhood, uh, an individual with a pickup truck has a like, you know, five-by-eight flatbed, almost like that one in the upper right-hand corner. That individual moves it all the time. I know it's part of his work. Uh, and sometimes it's there at 8 o'clock at night. Sometimes it's there at 9 o'clock in the morning, depending on his particular involvement. Now, am I, this is why I say, I'm not going to complain against the guy. But if your travels, if our law enforcement are having to travel down that street, is there going to be action taken as a result of what we may or may not talk about tonight? So, Mayor, I think what you're getting to is, is what's the reason for the time? And Mr. Hager and I spoke uh, of how, how do we achieve what we want but still have it broad enough to where um, we're not being overly um, uh, burdensome on, on people. I mean, we're, we're a free people, and we start from there. Um, but again, we have the ability uh, in, in a municipality to decide, you know, how do we want that to look. Um, so does, does this... Would this remove discretion from the law enforcement officers? No, I mean, it, it actually gives us some discretion. Just, See, that, I mean, that's, where, you know, that's, where, that's where common sense kind of comes and, into and it gives play. Us and some those clarity. time limits have, Just you know, because it's there after 11 o'clock on one night, we might not get to it. But if we can go back and we can say, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I do remember, or we can more uh, definitively say, hey, that's been there um, overnight, um, and it's, it's continually coming. It, it gives us a little bit more of ability to address the issues when they come. Otherwise, we're just kind of trying to negotiate what at least some of our citizens are looking for us to do, and we're just looking for some direction. Because I think it gives, it keeps our discretion, it keeps uh, the ability for citizens to, if they need to park it there, if you got lawn companies that are, you know, treating your lawn, 
gives them that ability and gives us some, some clarity on how you guys want us to deal with this. Okay, uh, Mr. Contreras. Okay, um, first off, let, let me tell you that, that I've, I've worked for many years with the police department where these issues were sometimes in the front yard, then people would push these things out into the street to get away from me. The police would come and, and, and it is, it is a, a tremendous amount of resources the police have to put on these and um, they aren't and shouldn't be a priority except where they become uh, traffic safety issues and we've had a lot of those. Um, but at the end of the day, what I'm, what I'm gonna say is that writing ordinances to cover this type of thing is, is it, like the cliche goes, it's like making sausage, okay? And I don't, I don't think that while we're looking at good ideas given to us from the PD side that would help their job be a little easier, we have to have a full discussion to discuss what we want on our streets, okay? What we want and when we want them there. I like the idea of giving them discretion. I think that's always a good, uh, good thing. They use good judgment, but at the same time, you have to think about the ramifications. After 11 o'clock at night, the problems that I have in, in, in Fair Meadows with, with traffic, crowded streets, and the problem that uh, Ms. Cherry has in, in Hollywood Park with overloaded streets, this is only gonna contribute to it if we allow these things after 11 o'clock. So time suddenly didn't become the priority for us. We don't want these things that are at all in those neighborhoods where they're constantly complaining. One of the reasons the dimensions was put in here was uh, it was a, a coordinated effort between Chief Brown and the fire department and myself to try to develop a, a process for determining how big is too big. Okay, so we're going the opposite way now. How big is too big? And too big is when, when our quint, as we used to have, would turn a corner and they can't get down the street. And uh, um, Councilman Veracruz will, will, will verify those seconds are life or death when they have to back up. So they, they, they found that by legally parking 18 inches from the curb, that is the law, you have to park within 18 inches of the curb with any vehicle on the street, that when you have these larger vehicles, if they're parked to the maximum on both sides across from each other and they actually put vehicles in place to, to run this test, and they realized, well, that's, that's why we have to have these dimensions. It's as close as we can get to minimizing the, the, the uh, and, and it doesn't just apply, by the way, to emergency vehicles, although that's priority one. It, it also applies to our garbage trucks and our school buses. They all complain about these things. So before we make a decision, I really believe that we need to workshop this to get into some more of the details about, we're seeing, that's a nice little, that's a pop-up trailer, by the way, and it's covered under camper trailers in our ordinance, uh, that picture on the lower right. Um, they're currently not allowed um, to be parked on the street, but there may be an occasion where somebody is getting ready to leave town and you pull up and uh, uh, somebody says, we're just coming around with the truck to hook it up. Yeah, those are gonna happen. But that's a pretty one right there. Now in my career, I've seen about 50% of them that don't look anything as nice as that. And do you want that parked out in front of your house? Because you don't have to park that in front of your own house. If we make it legal, you don't have to park in front, you can park it two doors down if you want. And it'll be legal to do that and it may be a lot uglier than this one. So I'm saying all this to say that we should workshop this to the extent that we, uh, we understand as a city, where do we wanna go with what we allow in the fronts of our properties? There's a reason we don't allow a lot of things to be parked in your driveway, for instance. The only legal thing you can have in a driveway is a licensed vehicle, a licensed boat on a trailer with a license, and a licensed camper trailer with a license. The reason for that is in the neighborhoods where everything's front entry, if you have the benefit of parking an ugly trailer behind your house in Swan Ridge or Greenbrier, it's out of sight, out of mind. But when it's parked on the street, in a driveway or on the street and it's ugly, that neighborhood has to accept that, that that's, we're allowing that. And so that's why these rules are in place and there's a lot of them. Their issues are very complicated and need to be addressed so that we can, we can maximize their, their time and their resources and not have to deal with uh, an overabundance of these. But we also have to look at what, where we're pushing them to, where, where, where we're gonna, where we're gonna open up um, the barn door, so to speak. We have to know and be aware so that we can make a reasonable decision to protect not only 
what's going on in the street and the police time, but also the aesthetics of our neighborhoods. And I, I think that's something we're not able to talk about in, in this light because uh, we just don't have the time for it. But I think that it would be worth uh, having the chief come back and uh, have staff come back with maybe some, uh, some of their uh, out of, uh, code services come out and talk about some of their experiences to help us understand by allowing these things, and I've already given you one example. After 11 o'clock in the neighborhoods where we get these massive complaints about parking on the street, um, this is only gonna make it worse because they're not gonna move them at seven o'clock in the morning. They're gonna stay there till the police come by and tell them you're supposed to move it at seven. So now you're sitting there till 10 o'clock and you've got the same traffic parking problems that the people have been coming to us week in and week out complaining to us about and we've now contributed to it inadvertently where we're trying to help the police solve their problems. So a workshop's the only way we can bring the thoughts from both sides onto the table so we can decide as, as a council what do we want Duncanville to look like. So I would recommend that we um, uh, move this to a work session at a future council meeting. Thank you, Mr. Coons. Thank you. So, yeah, I would agree about moving into a work session. I just had one question. Uh, the calls and complaints that y'all get, are those coming before 11 o'clock p.m. or after 11 o'clock p.m.? You know, they just come in general. Again, the time uh, Mr. Hager suggested, because that gives us some point in time that after a point in time, it's, we can, we have that ability to, to deal with that. So the time, uh, I, I would encourage, you, uh, the council not to focus too much on that. That's how we're trying to deal with this, um, but we get complaints all throughout the day. And then real quick, could you go back to the slide with the dimensions? With the dimensions? With the, yes, sir. So, and, and I also wanna, uh, Councilman Contreras mentioned something if I may, uh, just to give a little bit of clarity. So there's a difference in, in uh, the police department um, is tasked with dealing with most of the parking issues on the street. Uh, because of abatement issues, um, neighborhood services deal with maybe some of the parking issues Mr. Contreras uh, alluded to. Um, the trailer parking, I think that goes back to 1292. And I think that's, that's gonna be on the property. So um, we just wanted to point that out. Yes, sir. I'm done. Okay. Uh, City Manager, you had a comment, please. I just wanted to highlight <clears throat> part of why I asked this, him to bring you an ordinance is because we receive a number of calls from citizens and councils about these issues. And currently we have nothing that we can do about it. And so, we were trying at a first level is to have an ability to not just to, when we get a call about a trailer or an issue, to do this. And so I think what I'm hearing, and I just want to clarify if we were bringing this back, is are we looking for more teeth in it and more stringent? Uh, we, we limited it this time based on the recommendation of our city attorney versus going to an extreme of just banning them. Uh, as some cities do. And so I, I don't mind bringing it back, but we just wanna, and you can give us more definition later, but we, we initially could, in some cities it is, you cannot park a trailer on your street at all. Uh, our attorney thought that it would be too difficult to just jump totally into it, but I think that um, if council's looking for something with a little bit more definition, then we can bring it back with that. Uh, but that's how we got to the sub versus the full extreme. I would concur with Mr. Contreras's suggestion that we chat about this a little bit further, uh, whether it's in a workshop or however we do that. Uh, I think that it would be worthwhile because attorneys are worth their salt as well, but sometimes you know, <laughs> we have the ability to accept or reject advice and counsel. And uh, you know, it's those the, the time parameters are most concerning to me in terms of our law enforcement dealing with that particular matter. When there may be something more urgent on the plate that we have to deal with, uh, and that's why I, I get, again ask, you know, is there is this sufficient? 
for law enforcement to have enough teeth to actually do something with. And then looking at what we have, if you go down further in the resolution, there are defenses. Here's how you can, if you're prosecuted, it says in prosecution, these are acceptable defenses in terms of how you can say, no, don't cite me and don't take me to court because this is, this is who I am and it's my piece of property. So I think it's worthwhile that we chat about this a little bit further uh, in, in how we do that city manager uh, arrange but it for feedback from everybody and what we can do always is best practice and put it uh, I, hate to, I can't do another December 1st but let me look at the calendar because I don't want to delay this because of the calls uh, but our next council meeting on November 15th would that be soon enough as a workshop is that enough adequate time for you folks, for law enforcement, to examine, you know, what other cities are doing and give us some advice in, in terms of and maybe even crafting something, or is it just going to be discussion and we look at crafting something after that? We've crafted, but what we need from you is what we're missing. And I think I heard from Mr. Contreras is if there is a definition where we have missed some things, if everyone can just give us feedback and then when we work through this in the conversation, we can talk about the pros and cons. We may want to prohibit certain vehicles and you all, as you said, may want to be stronger or you may want to be softer. But the one thing that we can't do is that every time when we get calls from council, we don't really have the uh, big stick for enforcement because we don't have the rules. Right. Yeah, I understand. Mr. McBurnett, comment, please. Not a comment, Mayor. I'm going to make a motion to table it. We, uh, after all that discussion, and I think that's exactly where we were headed, uh, that we have a motion to table. Is there a second? Second. Uh, council, please vote on tabling this. To, to November the 15th. To November 15th. Please vote on tabling to November the 15th. Unanimously approved. Thank you. Thank you. And hope we haven't overburdened our police and law enforcement in this, but that's enough. <laughs> uh, we, we'll, we'll discuss it. You've heard the comments. And you know exactly what we're thinking about and, and how we can do this. Don't want to push that. Uh, okay. That concludes item five. Now we're going to go back to item 4C which I requested to be taken from the consent agenda to be moved to the items for individual consideration. And this is the Banking Depository RFA. I requested this to be put on item for individual consideration because I wanted to make some concerns of my personal concerns known in terms of further continuing our banking with Wells Fargo. There are uh, certain things that I want to give consideration to, uh, and I will discuss those subsequent to Ms. Atmore's presentation on this. So Ms. Atmore, please. Yes, sir. Good evening, uh, Mayor, Council Members, and City Manager. Uh, tonight, we want to present to you the results of the request for application for banking depositories. And with us tonight is a member of our Valley View consulting team who will go through their process of sending out the RFA with our staff, with our procurement, our chief procurement officer, Mr. Tayo Shikali. And he will go over the results and the outcomes of that with you on the bank depository. So with that, we have Mr. Tim Fanon here tonight who will go over that presentation. Good evening, Mayor, Council, City Manager. Um, yeah, so just we thought it would be helpful just to go kind of cover what, what the steps are involved in, in going through an RFA process, what we're looking at, what we're evaluating. Uh, and of course, the purpose is to select a, the, the depository contract for the city. By law, this is a requirement for cities to go through every five years by Chapter 105. So this initial agreement will begin in February of next year. Uh, and that first one, what we do is our recommendation, what most of our cities will do, is they'll break that five-year contract into a two-year contract followed by three one-year renewals. So that kind of gives the city a check-in place just to make sure the bank is taking good care of you, you're happy with the services that are being provided, uh, and it's just a kind of a check on the relationship. So with those extensions, it has the ability to go through January of 2028. 
So again, I mentioned Chapter 105. That's one of the primary statutory codes that governs how this process is run. We also look at uh, the Conflict of Interest Act, Public Fund Investment Act, Public Fund Collateral Act. So the steps involved, one of the things we need to do is take a look at what services the city is using. It's a, it's a more complex service than a lot of us use in our day-to-day -day banking lives. Uh, there's some pretty uh, sophisticated banking services that a city needs from its bank. So we're looking at those. Uh, and we, we look at the city's historical usage, what kind of volumes are going through. Uh, and so we look at what are the services that the city is using? Are there any additional services maybe they haven't been using that should be added as part of this request? Uh, and then we establish that minimum. The next thing to do is to look at what are the banks that are eligible within the city's uh, city boundaries. And so there are um, seven that are seven banks within the city of Duncanville. Uh, and so we, we contacted each of them because one, one thing that can't, one misstep that can happen, sometimes you send out the RFA, it doesn't get to the right person at the bank. They realize, hey, Duncanville's out for RFA two weeks later. Well, they don't have enough time to prepare a response. So we make sure on the front end we're getting it to each of the right contacts at each of those banks. Uh, and then we work with uh, the city staff to put together the RFA to say these are the services the city wants. That this is what we're using, this is what we're requiring, can you provide these services? Part of Chapter 105 requires an advertisement. We do that, it's a little redundant because we're contacting every bank individually, but we do that just to follow the rules. Uh, the RFA is then posted on the city's website, the banks are notified, the RFA is out there, they can come and get them, uh, and no additional RFA requests were received as a result of the, of the required advertisement. The next thing that we do is uh, we host a pre-application Zoom call. And the purpose of this, it does a couple of things. One, it kind of gives us a gauge of what kind of interest we're seeing from the local banks. Uh, and then it also gives the banks, uh, we're hoping they it kind of create some interest on their part too. We walk through the RFA with them. We talk about the services, answer any questions they may have. Uh, on an earlier slide, we had a typo and then we had JP Morgan Chase, but it was actually PNC Bank that attended that Zoom call. So we had those three banks attend that conference, uh, including Wells Fargo, who's the incumbent, Frost and PNC, and by the deadline, those three banks had responded and submitted applications to the city. If I might interrupt sure. real quick, just to make sure that I understand the process. So in the advertisement, we advertised for this virtual call. So the advertisement is and, just that the three, RFA's and been- And only a three oh. banks responded and came onto that virtual call. Or virtual meeting. Yeah, so I'll, uh, so the advertisement is just that the RFA has been released. I believe that was in the Dallas, no, it was the Duncanville Today, I believe, is where that is posted. So the purpose of the advertisement is a requirement to let banks know that the city is going out for uh, requesting applications for bank depository applications. So how did we advertise the virtual call? Good question. So we've got the email addresses of all of the bankers, and so we send a meeting invite to each of those bankers to attend a Zoom call. There you go. Okay. So, Thank you. Okay. So Thank no, you. good question. Uh, and so, and, and those three accepted and attended, and again, the, and then they submitted applications. Uh, so this is a kind of a list of the evaluation, the things that we're looking at, uh, and when we're trying to make a decision. Uh, and at the top of that list is the ability to perform. Uh, all banks do banking, but they don't necessarily all do it the same. There are levels of technical capabilities that different banks offer. Uh, we also want to talk to their references. If you're looking at making a bank change, we want to talk to those references. Obviously, cost of services is a primary consideration. Uh, another factor is transition cost. It is, it's quite a bit of work involved in moving from one bank to another. Uh, we want to look at the interest rates, uh, both on the interest-bearing accounts and the deposits. And then earnings credit rate is a, a feature that banks will use to uh, compensate the city for the balances that the city holds uh, at the bank. And so those can be used to offset those bank service charges. Uh, we will want to factor in if for the incumbent bank, what does that service, what's the previous service relationship been? Has it been good? Has it been lacking? We want to look at convenience of locations. Is that satisfactory? Uh, we want to make sure we've got complete applications. Then lastly, uh, we want to look at the financial strength and stability. And so we use a third-party service to go in and do a deep dive on these institutions. They've got some metrics that they run just to make sure that all of the institutions are financially sound. And in this case, all three of those measured well on that financial grading. 
So again, just to highlight the key applicants, obviously monthly service fees that they're providing based on that fee schedule we provide, which is based on actual city usage. Uh, we want to look at the earnings credit rate, interest, uh, any contract incentives they offer, and another factor is the banking capabilities. So this is a look at, we, at what we did with the analysis of those applications that we received. So we got the, the three applications from Frost, PNC, and Wells Fargo Bank. And as you can see, Wells Fargo Bank was quite a bit lower on a monthly basis uh, than the other two applicants. The next thing we looked at was what are the bank rates that are being offered. And so um, the first two, Frost and PNC, those are what are called bank managed rates. And we have those in red because those are not as favorable to the city. What bank managed means is if rates go up, as a former banker, I can tell you, banks kind of drag their feet on raising rates when rates start going up. When rates go down, banks are really quick to drop those rates. So, and you're kind of at the mercy of what the, what the bank chooses to pay. Um, you do Sometimes you do have options if you can do other things with your money, but you're kind of at their mercy on what they're going to pay. The Wells Fargo option is an investment sweep. It's a, it's a market rate. So in this rate, rising rate environment, as you all know, rates are going up very quickly with the Federal Reserve action. And so as those rates go up, this is going to go up independent of what Wells Fargo decides to do. It's, a, it's investing in a, a, a market portfolio of securities, so the city benefits from those rising rates, as you can see here. Uh, there's a pretty significant difference in, in the rates there. So the next thing we do is we take the fee schedule, those interest rates, and we multiply it out over, we look at the two-year period and the five-year period, and we kind of boil it down to a bottom line number. So after you pay your fees, after you get either earnings credit or interest rate, what's the net result? And so again, in that analysis for the two-year period, um, Wells Fargo was a little over $300,000 uh, better benefit financially to the city than the other two. And if you look at it over the five-year period, PNC was clearly the, the, the second best. Uh, but that financial difference between those two is close to a million dollars because of that higher interest rate and uh, bank fees that are about half of what PNC and Frost were charging. The last line um, was additional incentives. So a lot of times they will provide incentives to either provide, a lot of times they'll, they'll provide financial incentives to pay for uh, supplies that the city uses, deposit bags, endorsement stamps. Uh, and that kind of thing. And so we factored those in as well, and that didn't, didn't really shift the difference a lot, uh, but that, that's kind of the bottom line there. So in looking at that analysis, uh, that, that the city has had a favorable uh, relationship with the city, they've got uh, a very good technological uh, presence. Uh, the terms are obviously very favorable, uh, proven track record with the city, the staff is happy with the service that's being provided. And third, but definitely not least, uh, staying with the incumbent does eliminate uh, the cost and the work of changing banks, which is uh, considerable. So, so that is really kind of our, our analysis, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have for me. Thank you. I want to go on record in terms of why I felt it was necessary for to bring this two items for individual consideration rather than consent. And it's based on the past history, not of our dealing with Wells Fargo, but Wells Fargo as a corporation, as a banking institution. When in the past, uh, several years ago, they were found guilty by the SEC of fraudulent business practices. Mm -hmm. And it was at that time when I was first on council that I said, we need to consider these practices and possibly not work with Wells Fargo. Coming into play with those kinds of decisions in terms of my own personal ethics and what I consider our fiduciary responsibility of myself and the council and the city, monetary ethic has to come into play. You know, what does it cost? And I was told it would be very expensive to change. And as a result of that, being a numbers guy, I said, okay, you know, numbers are important. Wells Fargo was, was taking the task, fined several millions of dollars, and, and they lost a lot in terms of reputation and credibility throughout the banking fin in, uh, institutions. So with that background and history, it's, it's always been planted in the back of my mind here that we're mm -hmm. still dealing with Wells Fargo. Most recently, uh, there are now some new allegations that have come forward. And those allegations have been presented by some uh, Congress people 
uh, Senator specifically, they are they're now looking at some other problems going on within Wells Fargo. So I looked at that and tried to understand, you know, is it still an issue for me personally to understand what those are? And the key to it is, is that those are still allegations. In the past, Wells Fargo was found guilty and fined several million dollars. Mm -hmm. What's happening today in terms of their reputation being questioned are still allegations. So I have to be careful in my balancing of this in terms of the allegations that have yet to be proven versus the past and taking into consideration what we see here is the dollars involved. There's a million dollars here. Going back to what it, slide 10, I guess. You know, if we go back to slide 10, uh, being a numbers guy, numbers, numbers tell a huge story. I do. You know, so, you know, how do I, how do I balance this million dollar puppy in terms of my personal thoughts about dealing with the company that's only been alleged to now have some um, practices that shouldn't be there. So here's, here's what I'm gonna, I'm gonna close this out. I still have concerns dealing with Wells Fargo. Whether we as a city continue to deal with them, I think is up to this entire council. It is your recommendation as a professional counselor on this issue that we continue to deal with them. It is a recommendation still of our financial services director that we continue to deal with them. And I will say this to council. Council members, please listen to me very carefully now. I am opposed to dealing with Wells Fargo because of their past history, not on their present problems, because they have yet to be proven. But in terms of a sound business case for continuing to deal with Wells Fargo, it is the best that this city should be doing to continue to deal with Wells Fargo. I will be voting in opposition to this only because of my personal ethic. I would advise council to consider this million dollar bogey that's out there as being extremely important to what our future is financially and that to consider Properly, what's happened is we have a, a two-year contract. And between now and two years from when this contract could be renewed, mm -hmm. we will probably find out whether these allegations that are now on the table are true or not. And we, as a council, will have a better understanding of how to deal with whether we extend our contract with Wells Fargo or we look at some other financial institution. So my recommendation to council is that this be approved with my understanding that I have concerns and I just want to go on record of that you know and many times in the past this council mayor I'm gonna call point order it's been over three minutes so there's been a point of order called and when there's a point of order called the point of order comes to a vote by the City Council so City Council uh, if you uh, approve stopping my conversation, we need to vote on this point of order. All those in favor of this point of order for my stopping my conversation, please vote. Uh, that point of order has been approved with myself as dissenting. Any further discussion? Mr. Contreras. Yeah, my only point uh, is to, as I stated in the... Um, briefing session um, that um, I, I still have to repeat even, and I appreciate your, your candid comments mayor um, I still have to repeat that this this branch in which we're working in here in Duncanville um, I think I heard that they'll be significantly impacted or I, maybe I'm putting that word in and it's not appropriate but describe to us the impact it's going to have on our community bank here uh, pulling out at this point because I don't think this bank has been alleged to have done anything wrong at any time as far as I know so could you could you <coughs> talk to us a little bit about the impact in in general um, I don't know that I could just as a, because Wells Fargo is such a large institution but to your point yeah I'm not aware of anything going on in this location I one thing I guess it's a challenge for Wells Fargo is they have 270,000 employees so that's that's a lot of people to manage and and people as we know people human failures 
that is going to happen. It, and you know, I think the question is, what do you do about it? Do you address it? Do you remedy it? Uh, because unfortunately, humans are going to be humans, um, and they are going to make mistakes. Um, but yeah, to your point, locally um, and at the branch level here, that that has not been an issue that I'm aware of. Okay. Well, I understand uh, the mayor's comments, both in briefing and out here, and I really do understand that sure. that question that comes to everyone's mind. Um, I'm, I'm equally concerned about the impact of the local community bank here, but I do have to ask going forward um, before we go to vote. Um, having said all this, and this is for the attorney, uh, I bank at this Wells Fargo here. Do I need to recuse myself? Okay, I'm fine with that. Thank you. Mr. Harvey. Okay, just real quickly, thank you, Mayor, for your comments. I share your concerns, and very simply, we'll be watching. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Koontz. Thank you, Mayor. So when I came in and sat in the briefing room, something was put in front of me and uh, some information was provided that I hadn't heard before, so I think it needs to be considered and weighed in. Um, my, my question is for the finance director. So what, what, as far as switching over to a different institution, uh, what's, what's the cost associated with that? And then how much work, extra work for you and your staff is associated with that? Well, that, that is a loaded question, um, basically because um, this entity, we probably process over 100 transactions a day going through the bank, okay? Moving a bank um, with this size, with all, the, all of the automated features that we have in it between uh, your accounting department and your utility billing department and all the departments um, in the city would be a tremendous effort. In fact, trying to do that at this stage to coordinate that, we would not make the February expiration date of this contract. It's just not possible. Uh, even when we, you do a new bank, the transition from one bank with all of the stuff we have going on as a city uh, takes about six months. And then even then you still have trailing transactions that you still have to keep the bank open to make sure that you catch everything. Uh, so the cost to the real city is the business processes that are in place every day and to the workers that you have in the workforce that are, that are trying to book your entries, book your cash, pay the invoices and all of that processing. That is the real cost to the, because we're gonna spend extra time trying to do that. And this is a city that runs, you know, the resources that we have. Uh, we're not as big of departments. We don't have big staff like other cities may have. So this would be a major effort. And at this stage of the game, it is probably um, a major feat. I'm not sure we, can, we could accomplish by February of 2023. Uh, Mr. Mac Burnett. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I see it. Would, would you say that governmental banking is different than public banking? Yes, sir, it is. Um, the consumer side of the, the house of a bank is different than the governmental side. If you remember, the governmental um, banking is basically, they are, there are a lot of compliance um, issues that they are bounded by, we have a lot of acts that we have to go by. And so those banks have to have our investment policy, they have to go by the Public Funds Investment Act, they have to go by the, um, the Texas Local Government Code. And so those are a lot of things. We also have to be collateralized. Um, any deposit that we have in excess of 250K has to be collateralized with other securities or letters of credit. So those are some things that some banks are not gonna be able to handle with the amount of money. We have over $34 million sitting in a local bank right now. So that will be something difficult for other banks maybe in order to do. Thank you. And um, Mayor, I share your same concerns about the 
Wells Fargo and their reputation. I know they've been fined and, and, and that kind of line, but based upon that hearing, I'm going to make a motion that we approve. To uh, well, there are individuals that wish to speak for that. That's fine. I'm, I'm still I'm still saying my motion is going to be out there. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mr. Harvey, you spoke, and Ms. Cherry has not yet. I will come back to you, Mr. Harvey, Ms. Cherry. Thank you, Mayor. So um, while I, too, agree with, with the mayor, as far as the concerns, as a business owner, I almost lost my financial team when I tried to switch because of my personal feelings one time with the bank. So thank you all for putting all this hard work together. And yeah, I, I, I agree. Um, it's it's a, big, a big move to try to do all that, especially my business is nowhere near the amount of money that the city has, but yeah. Well, so thank you. And one other note on that, not only does it impact your financial staff here, there can be community impact too because utility billing is a big user of the banking side. It's, it's, a, it's the big bulk of what the city needs the banking for. And so you're talking about impacting lockbox for the people that mail in their payments. You're talking about people that do the online bill pays, what's called an electronic lockbox. Changing that can be disruptive. Banks try to make it as smooth as possible, but there is potential impact to the community where your citizens, are, are, their payments are end up being posted late, they get late fees. So yeah, those are just things to be aware of. It's hard to quantify, but just that, that is a, a reality to your point. It's like there, there can be impacts to a change. And we did take in the, con the bank relationship with this bank. Um, if we did not have the good relationship with this bank, um, that will be a consideration for our staff as well. Um, but Wells Fargo has been very responsive to our needs. Um, anytime we have needed something to kind of put in a little automated feature, they have come in and there's a lot of paperwork, but we, <laughs> we, have, we have jumped, they have jumped through the hoops in order to make those things happen. And so with that type of response, it is, kind of hard to say, okay, with all the business case that we have sitting here, it was kind of hard to recommend anything other. Mr. Harvey. Thank you, Mayor. Just real quickly, um, I, <clears throat> as some of you know, share the same profession with um, finance director at Moore. And so this time of year is very critical because they're finalizing the budget. They're trying to gear up for the audit. Everything has to be done timely. And so I don't think this would be a, a, a good thing to do at this point to add another uh, burden um, to what they have to do. So I, I, would, uh, I will second, if no one else has any other comments, I will second the motion uh, that... Um, Councilmember McMahonet stated. We have a motion, we have a second, it's still open for discussion. I would like to close this discussion by saying that I'm voting my heart and what I feel my personal ethics, but I do know that this is the best action. So even though I will dissent for the record, I know that this is what's best for the city as I see this move going as an approval, most possibly. So council, Please vote. We have a motion to approve. Please vote. We have a vote of six to one with the mayor dissenting. Thank you very much. The motion is approved. Thank and thank you for bringing this to our item for individual consideration. We now take it to our final item on our um, agenda. Item number six, staff and board reports. Police department quarterly report. And I see we have... Uh, Chief Stockner. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor, Council. Um, I'm happy to present the last presentation of the night. <laughs> it's always good to do, <clears throat> if I may. So this quarterly report is our third quarterly report uh, through July and September. Um, so we'll, we always start with our staffing and personnel. Um, Officer Acosta, um, as you guys have received weekly updates, he has graduated field training. He's currently on a night shift. Um, Officer Brandon Dunn, again, you guys are receiving these. Um, he should graduate sometime in December. Um, our recruit, uh, Detterman, is currently attending the Regional Police Academy, and we're looking at her uh, to graduate the academy in late December. I'm sorry, early December 
uh, to where she then comes in and uh, begins our two-week in-service program before she goes into field training. Um, training and personnel administered the civil service exam, which the city manager um, highlighted on September 24th. Um, our training and personnel divisions currently and diligently um, conducting background investigations um, on our applicants. Um, obviously, we are uh, we don't want to lower any standards, get people in here hired quicker. So these processes take a little time for us to fill the vacancies that we currently have. Uh, development of our staff, um, we feel that that's obviously very important uh, to, to continue the service um, our, our citizenries deserve, our citizenry deserves. Um, some of the classes that we highlight, now there's more, but these are the ones that we like to highlight. Uh, Assistant Chief uh, Freese, Lieutenant McCaleb, and Lieutenant Wilcott attended the FBI LEDA Executive Leadership Training Course. Um, that is a trilogy, so there's three different classes that you, uh, you attend. They're a week long, and then you get a trilogy award, um, which Lieutenant Wilcott received, uh, which encompasses the Supervisor Command and Executive Leadership courses. Um, Officers Rollins and McMiller attended a new Supervisor Training course um, that allows them to fill in for our supervisors, our uh, formal supervisors, whether it's a sergeant or a lieutenant. Uh, to cover the shifts. Um, obviously, vacation and time off um, certainly helps with mental health, and we want to make sure that <clears throat> our supervisors uh, maintain their mental health, so we allow them to take off uh, as long as they have a, an acting supervisor. Um, Officer Aaron's attended field training officer course. That is almost like a step into a new supervisor. Um, that particular officer then takes on a role as a supervisor for their rookie that they train. Uh, whether it's a four weeks, but throughout their 17-week field training. Um, moving on to the next slide, uh, our regional care team. <clears throat> As you all know, we are partnered with several other agencies. Um, Officer Ambrosio Hernandez was selected for the care team back in May. Um, during the time that uh, I'm presenting here, um, he's contacted or he receives reports from our patrol officers, he re reviews them, reaches out to these uh, people who are in crisis and tries to provide or help with um, getting them to um, appointments, um, taking them to get their medication, things of that nature. Um, so he has made a total of 376 contacts during this reported period and 57 of those clients received some service from Officer Hernandez. Um, the reference uh, contacts and clients needing service all came from a patrol officer, which I said. Uh, the next slide, patrol activity comparison at a glance. So you look at last year, uh, July through September, uh, we answered 11,625 calls. So it, it almost mirrors each other compared from last year to this year. Our citizens on patrol, um, they conduct these BMV report cards, which you all have been briefed on previously. Um, during this time period, they responded to Costco twice and Winco once. Um, our pass rate seems to increase as education um, gets out there, whether it's through our social media or doing events like this. Um, our department activity over these uh, previous three months, we've had six use of force incidents, or we're referring it to as a response to resistance. Um, all were found to be lawful and within departmental policy. Um, we had one pursuit vehicle, uh, which we do a significant review administratively. It was well within our policy. And then we had two internal complaints for policy violations and both are current investigations. So our community engagement, if you notice the picture on the top left, um, that's our second annual employee appreciation game. As you all know, the police department won the softball game, so we made it two years in a row. This particular year, we bowled. Um, I'm not a very good bowler, but as you see, I have a good group of uh, fellows there that, that took home the trophy, which is in the admin office, if you guys are more than welcome to come over and look at it. Um, but during these three months, um, in July, we had seven meetings with just under 2,000 partnerships. In August, five with 295. In September, we had 12 with 1259. So getting into our NIBR stuff, 
Um, obviously, you guys see this as well in our weekly report. And this is our NIBRS offenses. Um, and we'll go through each particular district. So our Group A offense, um, you have Cedar Hill, DeSoto, Duncanville, and Lancaster. Um, the September, when, when we pulled this data, uh, the September information wasn't yet posted. So all we have to go on right now is just July and August. Um, the data could differ based on a, on a few things, but that's what we pulled on October 6th. <coughs> Excuse me. So the next thing we had or was asked to do was to add a slide on our motor vehicle theft comparison and then add some cities in here so you guys have some relevance to uh, what we're dealing with. And, and understand this isn't just a, a Duncanville issue. As you can see, there's plenty of others out there. Um, so you're looking at the first, second, and third quarter. It's a lot of numbers in there. I try to make it as easy to read as possible. Um, but that's, that's where we're at. Again, this is um, data that I pulled on October 10th of this, this month. <clears throat> Excuse me. So July 2022, major crimes. You have District 1 uh, through 5. I'll let you guys look for it or look through it. You have August and then September. If you guys, and that's the presentation. If you guys have any questions, uh, thank you, Chief. Really appreciate it. And yes, sir. Our, you know, looking at that, I can't believe it's been a quarter since we looked at these data. It's like yesterday that we looked at all these this information. But yeah, Mr. Contreras. Yes, sir. Of course. Sorry. Um, well, how about 85? 85. Nope, I'm still wrong. All I right. I thought I had the right one. It was uh, the picture of the uh, CARES officer. Is that what you Okay, sure. About? There you go. 83. Well, I was <laughs> um, I'm really excited about this because I, I hadn't seen an update on this, and that's probably my, my fault. I missed it somewhere, but um, I know when these folks came and spoke with us, some months ago, um, I hadn't kept track of this. But just to be clear, th this officer, in addition to providing these services we've described here in this first paragraph, um, he will also, he's also trained to respond to situations? Well, he, he still is an officer. So right. he, he is not necessarily responding with us immediately to these calls. It's more of a follow-up. Okay. However, if there is a situation where we feel that it's not an immediate response that we need, we can always contact them to come with us um, to respond to a call. But it's, I don't think we've done that yet. Okay, but, but he, he would be available if you felt that the response merited somebody trained in his background versus taking traditional uh, police actions against that individual? That's correct. Now, we also have mental health officers that... Um, not necessarily on each shift, but there may be a mental health officer on a shift okay. that would respond and has the training to to deal with those instances. As, as what, and Officer Hernandez has that training as well? I believe so, yes, sir. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Coons. Thank you. And uh, stand here with Officer Hernandez, so is, is, um, is he... Is, 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 is part of his job also working with the homeless community, especially those that may have mental health issues? So, yes, absolutely. Anybody who has, um, I don't want to say just issues in general, but anybody who is willing to accept the help, that's the important thing, is that unless there is a critical incident where we are required to protect that person from him or herself, we can only offer these, um, these items, um, and they have to accept them. We can't make them do anything, and that's the issue. Okay. And I just had uh, one other question. Is there any further details that, that we can get in the traffic stops as far as uh, in the, the quarterly reports? Could you pull that up, and then we can see what it's specifically of course. the traffic portion? Yeah, and I'm sorry, I didn't see which. Oh, actually, there it is. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess in, in future reports, is it possible to get a little more detail on, for example, what, what the stops are for and uh, at, 
Was it a run? Was it a red light? Yeah, what, speeding, the type or whatever, of right. stops was it a red light or suspicious? Is, is that a detail now, that we, we can do, get in the report? I, I believe that's part of our uh, annual report um, when we do our racial profiling uh, report. I just want to be very specific. We did add this based off the information that you provided us. If you want us to break it down um, even further, um, it would take a little work. It'll be very, very hard to read because it's a lot of information. Wait, you said it's provided in the annual report, so I guess we went back. So we already have the, some of that information. It's the racial, right? we it's should. The racial yes, profiling Absolutely. report, and it's very detailed in terms of That's correct. individuals stopped for whatever reason and their racial ethnicities. And if I recall mm -hmm. the numbers very okay. correctly, uh, it was a very small percentage of traffic stops that, well, in fact, most, you know, almost all of our traffic stops that were recorded in the, with this data that it was reviewed, that uh, the racial profiling was virtually zero. There was some type of violation that was occurring that caused the stop in the and, first and place. And I guess that's the detail that I'm asking about is, I guess, the type of violation. So as long as they issued a citation, we have that. Um, upon them stopping the car, um, that, that would be, almost impossible for us to get the reason why they stopped the car um, and only unless they issued a citation so the um, 12,387 stops um, we I don't know if would there's no way we could do that mm -hmm, yeah you got it <laughs> so to say there's no way um, th th there's not an efficient way to do that and um, I mean, I, the only thing I can think of off the top of my head, if we went back and watched video, interviewed officers, maybe a way. But understand, um, when we st stop people, we do it for a reasonable suspicion of a law violation. Uh, we're not, if we write a tra traffic citation, I can go to court and say, hey, give me all the, all the traffic citations we've written for a particular violation. That's, we're not going to be efficiently able to do that. No. Okay. So for clarification, just uh, picking back on what you were saying, but you, you Chief Stogner mentioned it. These stops are where a citation was actually issued or not. No. So, or not. so these are the number of stops that our officers make during this period, not necessarily the, the number citation. of citations written this period. Okay. We were asked to provide stops, and that's so the did. difficulty in capturing the data is if no citation was issued, there's no there's no record of why the stop was made. Unless we went Essentially. back, and maybe wat watched every video, interviewed officers. Right. And said, there's no that's it, a record. There's no data record to capture to come up with a statistic to show why that stop was made if no citation was issued. Not not an efficient manner. No. Right there it is. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So can we just get the details on the citations? Sure. The citation. Okay. Well, however, would yes. be the easiest way to provide that information. Uh, do you want it pre the next quarterly, or do you want it just kind of a understanding right now, more details on this? Uh, we can send not, it not out. Not right now, no, just maybe and, for and there the are next a lot quarterly. of. Do you, do you want top ten? I mean, because have you seen the traffic code? I'm just yeah, saying. Yeah. There, I mean, there, yeah. are, there are any number yeah, of. Yeah, sure. Top, top ten, sure. Top ten, yes, sir. Okay. okay. Next quarter. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let's see, Mr. McBurnett. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Chief Stogner, thank you for your presentation as, you as well. I want, I want to again congratulate uh, Assistant Chief Freeze as, as well for his promotion. Uh, Offer, Officer Hernandez, that, that was one of the first things I was going to talk about, but I've seen the job that he's done, seen the impact, and I know people that he's impacted, so uh, kudos towards that direction. Also, I want to give kudos to Officer Hankins because he helped me in a, in a, in a personal situation a, as well. And, and lastly, you know, when you have a citizen comment about our police chief picking up trash, the, the whole point is I appreciate this police department and what they do and so thank you uh, back to mr. Contreras uh, question. coming off of uh, some of Jeremy's questions uh, councilman Coons I'm sorry the um, is there a way to show during these traffic stops how many arrests may have been made there is 
Okay, that's something I'd be interested in too to see, um, you know, if they were stopped for a traffic violation, but on the way there you find out that there may be something a little more serious going on. Um, I think that's always a good thing if we can if we can uh, stop that from going ahead. And then I too want to uh, congratulate uh, new assistant chief Freeze. I hadn't had the opportunity yet, but I do. And then before we close out tonight, I want to thank this lady here, our new city secretary, because I think get, things have gone off without a hitch over here. So I'm, I'm real proud to, to have her on board finally. Thank you. Okay. Um, with the conclusion of our business, we are adjourned. The timestamp is 938.